Yeah, All right, good evening. How do I get this thing to work? All right, then we're good. Um, I'd like to call the July 25th, 2022 meeting of the Town of Arlington Redevelopment Board to order. Uh, please note that this meeting is being recorded by um, ACMI. Uh, so I'm Rachel Zemberry, Chair of the Board, and I'd like to do a roll call to confirm the members of the Board who are here with us this evening, starting with Ken Lau. Present. Jean Benson. Present. Melissa Tintakalis. Present. And joining us by, uh, via phone, uh, Steve Revelak. Present. Great. Thank you. Uh, so the first agenda item, uh, first agen item on our agenda this evening is the public hearing for docket number 3707. Do we have the applicant here for uh, 611 Massachusetts Avenue? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, if you could uh, come forward, that would be fantastic. We're looking forward to speaking with you this evening. So before, thank you so much. So before I ask you to begin, what I'd like to do is ask um, Kelly Linema, who is the uh, acting director of the Department of uh, Planning and Community Development, to um, to present an overview of the memo that was prepared by the department, and then we'd love uh, for you to share your application with us. Great, Kelly. Great. Thank you, Rachel. Um, Kelly Linema, Acting Director, Department of Planning and Community Development. So this docket is an application by the Sierra Stalin Museum for a post sign to be installed at, um, in front of 611 Mass Ave, which is right set behind Whittemore Park. Um, there previously was a post sign at this location. That post sign was removed as part of the Whittemore Park Revitalization Program, or plan uh, phase one that was completed last summer. Um, I did a little look, searching into the history of the sign at this location. It appears that everything at this location, both the museum use, the, um, the offices by the Chamber of Commerce, and then the Cutter Gallery date back to when the building was moved in 1989. So shortly after that, we have several leases that were made between those three institutions and the ARB uh, for renting of the space. And it appears that under Alan McLennan, the former planning director, um, those uses were permitted at the site and it's run and managed by the ARB and then the sign was installed shortly thereafter. Um, so there isn't evidence of a special permit for that sign beforehand and this is all dating back to like the 1989-1990 zoning bylaw so it's a little bit of a different construction. Um, Right now, the applicant is looking to install a post sign. Um, because the zoning district for 611 Mass Ave is the single family, the, R, the R1 zoning district, um, that post signs are not allowed in that district. However, it's kind of unusual because this is completely surrounded by the B3, B5, and R7 zoning districts. Um, it just happens to be R1, I believe, because it is a town-owned property. It's a municipal property. So the ARB under, um, I believe, section six point, um, sorry, I'm going back down to the signage section here. Um, per section 6.2.2C, the ARB has the flexibility to grant a special permit to allow signs in a location other than what is allowed. Um, the proposed sign is about 8.29 square feet in sign area. It's um, about four feet tall. It's designed out of fairly natural materials and um, fairly neutral colors, and it's very similar to the sign that was previously there, although it's a little bit smaller. That is um, pretty much, in essence, what is being proposed, and I invite Heather. <laughs> like everything I was going to say. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, before we begin, can you all hear what's being said, kind of? Great. I'm going to see if I can turn okay. this down. Give me one second. Test. You see the air, but test. I don't know if they can hear that. Can you hear this? My chair. Test. Absolutely. I can't hear it. 
Great, so, thank you so much. So if you wouldn't mind you. Um, introducing yourself and then uh, making any presentation that you'd like to the board this evening. Uh, yes, uh, thanks so much for having me. My name is Heather Lavelle. I'm the director and curator of the Cyrus Dallin Art Museum. Um, and just as Kelly said, we're looking to replace the post existing post sign that we had with another one that's of comparable dimensions and um, a little bit closer to the house. So the, um, the overall dimensions of the sign we're proposing is 58 inches by, uh, wide by 44 inches tall. Um, the designer is a board member named Chris Costello. He's a professional designer, works with the trustees um, and uh, on sign, mu museum signage for his, for his job. Um, we, he took into consideration a number of factors, the architecture of the house, the, the surroundings, the um, surrounding neighborhood, and some of the design principles that were discussed as part of the Whittemore Park project. Um, so the shape of it reflects the actual, um, there are some curved um, portions of the door, of the, the Jefferson Cutter House, which is very unique for its door, its carved wood door. So that shape of the sign sort of reflects, it's hard to see in that photo, but there are these curved decorative elements on the front door. Um, the, the color scheme relates to the house as well as the Dallin Museum's logo and branding and um, matches the wrought iron accents that have been chosen for the benches in the park. Um, the material would be, what is proposed is uh, wood posts with die bond, three millimeter die bond panels, two different panels, the large one for the Cyrus Dallin Art Museum, and then the smaller one across the bottom for the Arlington Chamber of Commerce. Um, we do, we would like to see if we could have permission to have a wood style sign. The original sign that we had in the park was made out of wood and it was determined to deteriorate it to contain, once it was pulled out of the ground for the pro project, we, we weren't going to be able to put it, put it back. So we're thinking long-term and cost. So we were hoping that we could perhaps go with an AZAC or some sort of a um, wood-like material. The location, uh, we worked with the Department of Planning and Community Development to select a spot to the left of the front door, centered underneath the two windows. So it's not going to go higher than those two, the, the sills of those two windows. And that was um, in consultation with the landscape architectural firm Crowley Cotrell, who um, suggest, helped to find a, a more favorable location. The pre-existing sign was in the in the park itself, and no one knew what the no one knew that the house was associated with the sign, so it didn't really help us draw visitors to the museum. But this sign in this location will, um, and let me just see if there anything else I want to mention. Uh, just based on need, and we, we've had, as everyone has had, a tough couple of years. Um, a lot of factors played into that, COVID, of course. Some of the disruption associated with the Whittemore Park project, and also not having a sign. Our visitation is very, very down, and um, ha having that sign will, be, will make a huge difference for, difference for us and for the Chamber of Commerce. And we do have the sign off of the Chamber of Commerce on the design. Great. Thank you so much. Thank I appreciate you. it. Thank you so much. So um, at this time, what I'd like to do is turn it over to members of the board to ask, any, um, ask you any questions they may have. Sure. And we'll open this up to the public to see if they have any questions or comments. And then we'll come back to the board and deliberate and um, see if we can move to um, a decision this evening. Okay. okay. And also, I should say that I am an employee of the nonprofit Cyrus Dallin Art Museum. Uh, Inc. and uh, trustee, uh, chair of the board of municipal board of trustee Sarah Burks is here as well. Great. So if you Thank have you for joining us this evening. Thank you. Great. Um, so at this time, I'd like to start by um, asking Ken if you have any uh, questions or comments for the applicant. Um, just two questions. I think this is a good sign. Fits well. Thank you. Uh, you said you want to make the post out of pressure treated wood or something like that? We were quoted, um, yes. So the original quote is for t um, the posts themselves being pressure treated wood, uh, four by four inch posts. The panels would be uh, a weatherproof aluminum called die bond. So the panels where the names go. I may suggest maybe instead of, and uh, uh, hoping within your budget, instead of the pressure treated four by four post, 
go over like a cedar post that's uh, also um, mm -hmm. uh, real, um, resistant to rot. Yeah. And it'll, it'll look nicer. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to base my decision on that, okay? But I'm just, that's a suggestion on my part. Do you use cedar that's a little nicer and it'll, it will, will stand uh, better than your regular pine or anything else you might put yeah. in there? Mm -hmm. And the other question is, is this thing lit at all? Is there any lighting on this? Oh, Kelly, can you answer that? Because there is lighting being installed as part of phase two. Yeah, so there's lighting being installed, um, one light along each front end of the building here, but that's separate from lighting for it. There's the, it's part of the sign itself lighting. is not illuminated. It's part of the up lighting for the house, and it will catch the... It will probably catch the sign, but it's not an illuminated sign. Okay, so the sign is not illuminated, and there's no designated sign light that's shining on the on the no sign. that's a good question do you so um if could we do that as part of of this or would we have to come before the board again how does how would it work if we wanted to light it um well I, i'm not gonna speak for the board um i may if we decide here i would probably turn it over to discretion of community development community uh the department. The department and have it, uh, have mm -hmm. it uh, reviewed instead of going through the whole process which you're going through right here now. Mm -hmm. um, they not generally know what we want and they can approve that. But for now, we're not approving anything with lights on it. Yep, okay. correct. Uh, that's all I had. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Ken. Jane, I'll go to you next. I don't have any questions. Great, Melissa. Well, actually, I'm sorry. sorry, please go ahead. Is this sign going to have to be approved by the historical? It does, the, um, the Dallin is on the, um, the August 2 agenda for the Historical Commission. So this is, uh, this is on the local inventory as well as the national and state inventory for historic. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. That was it. Great. Thank you, Jane. Melissa, any questions or comments for the applicant? Um, yeah, I guess I, I was thinking um, about the wording in terms of creating more invite, you know, in, in an invitation to uh, the art museum or the art gallery. Did you guys consider including something like you know, open to the public below or um, anything like that? We have um, a couple of different strategies that we normally use. So, because um, below it is the Chamber of Commerce's sign and we wanted to get our logo out there and the Paul Revere statue, make that very visible because we, Dallin is, um, you know, he's, he, his name is not a household name, but the Paul Revere statue is. So we wanted to make it graphically very obvious and, and interesting. Um, and then we put out open flags. And then we also, when the museum is open 12 to 4 on Saturdays and Sundays, we have a sandwich board that we put out saying museum is open today with an arrow right to the door. <laughs> so we have a couple of different strategies for drawing in the public when we're um, when we are open and we used to have our web address on the sign the old sign had our web address but we felt like if someone were to google us they'd find us right we are pretty high up on the seo so that's great i, I think my initial read of it, it just seems to me that it looks like the art museums run by the chamber of commerce mm. so i don't know if you want you know that's my initial read i know most people think that but um from my experience working at some the visitor center in lexington and so forth you know working on these strategies and trying to communicate exactly what you want um on these signs are important so, right for your consideration okay thank you yeah. great thank you um, Steve, do you have any questions or comments for the applicant? Steve. Uh, no questions, Madam Chair. Sorry. <laughs> no questions. Thank you. Um, and I also don't have uh, any questions. I appreciate the presentation. I thought it was Thank very you. clear and straightforward. Um, and I look forward to uh, deliberating with my colleagues. Thanks so much. Great. Um, so at this time, I'd like to um, open um, the hearing up to the uh, for public comment. So any member of the public joining us this evening who would like to uh, ask questions or make a comment, um, please indicate so by raising your hand, and I'll ask you to join us up at uh, the microphone, please. Um, so um, any member of the public speaking this evening during public comment, please note that you'll have up to three minutes to address the board. And we ask that you um, identify yourself by your first and last name, as well as address in Arlington. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair and members of the board. 
Um, my name is Sarah Burks. I live at 993 Massachusetts Avenue in Arlington, and I am the chair of the Municipal Board of the Museum, the Board of Trustees, and I just want to offer my support for this application. Um, we have been without a sign uh, for a number of years now. Um, in addition to the sign that this would be replacing, we used to have a sign um, that the uh, tourism committee uh, got placed in the park, but it blew down in a big windstorm and was never replaced. Uh, it was similar to the one at the Jason Russell House and the Old Schwamm Mill. So I feel like we really need a boost here. Um, I can't tell you how many times um, that we've had uh, that I, I've interacted with people and um, mentioned the museum and they have no idea that it's in town. So that's our um, biggest um, challenge as, as a, a cultural institution in town is just visibility and name recognition. Everybody knows this house, uh, you know, by another name. So uh, having the sign is very important. And um, our primary uh, visitors that walk in the door say that when we ask them to sign in and how did you hear about us, um, I'd say 75% of them say they were just walking by. So seeing that sign is really what draws people in. So we would appreciate your support. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are any other members of the public wishing to speak uh, on this docket? All right, seeing none, we will close public comment for docket number 3707. Um, and I'll turn it over to um, members of the board uh, to see um, any thoughts on approval uh, or any discussion topics, starting with Ken. No, I have none. I okay. motion to approve this. You're in support? Yes. Okay. Uh, Gene. Yeah, I'm supportive also. We have a precedent for this a few years ago on River Street. Yeah. There was the uh, automotive place in R1, and we allowed them to put in a sign that was consistent with the business district. This sign is consistent with the districts next door, and it's a little odd that it's in a R1 zone. So I'm very comfortable in approving this sign. Great, thank you, Jean. Melissa? Um, same. Great, thank you. Uh, Steve, your thoughts? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I have no concerns, and I am in favor of approval. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I also uh, am in favor and agree with um, Jean that we certainly have precedent for approving this type of sign in, in, a, in a district that is adjacent to a business district um, but happens to be in an R1. Um, so at this time, I um, wanted to see if any member of the board um, had any special conditions that you wanted to see as part of um, a motion for approval. Just if, if lights are added, it has to come back to the planning board for review. Okay, great. Not, not for us, but for uh, uh, planning board review. We'll great. Leave it at that. Department Thank of planning. planning. Department of planning and community yes. development. Yes. <laughs> great. And they would have to come back to us if the lighting is inconsistent with the bylaw, though. Co correct. If if they the department right. felt that they could not approve it right. because it was inconsistent. Right. Okay. Um, so, uh, is there a motion to approve docket 3707, uh, the sign for 611 Massachusetts Avenue with the special condition that any uh, additional sign lighting um, be reviewed administratively with the Department of Planning and Community Development for um, adherence with the uh, provisions of the sign bylaw? So motioned. Is there a second? Second. I have a Gene. comment on the findings that yes. is in here. I'd like the findings to say the nature of the use being made of the building and the location of the building. I'm sorry? I'd, I'd like the phrase and the location of the building be added to the findings. So it's the use being made of the building Got it. and the location of the building is such that allowing the proposed sign. Yeah. So I'd like that added to the findings. That sounds good. And I will re-motion again. Thanks, Jean. Okay. Uh, is there a uh, second on the amended motion? I second that. 
Great. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, so we'll take a roll call vote, starting with Ken. Yes. Jean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Steve? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Congratulations. Thank, thank you so much for coming in. We appreciate it. So docket, thank you. So docket 3707, 611 Massachusetts Avenue uh, has been approved. All right, um, so because we have the uh, continued public hearing for docket number 3704 posted for eight o'clock, what I'd like to do is take agenda item number four out of order and uh, review the meeting minutes from April 7th, 2022. So Kelly, if you could bring those yeah. up for us. One second here. Great, thank you very much. Um, so we'll uh, run through and see if any members of the boards have any of the board has any uh, additions or corrections for the meeting minutes from April seventh. Starting with Ken. No. Nope. Uh, Jean. Yeah. The, uh, one. There was a period missing at the end of one sentence. I need to just find it. So okay. Move on to Melissa. Sounds Lyle. good. Melissa, any additions or corrections? No. Steve, any additions or corrections for the meeting minutes? Uh, no additions or corrections, Madam Chair. Thank you, and I do not have any either. So, Jean, take your time. We have until eight o'clock. <laughs> um, oh, in the let me see, first page, the paragraph that starts with the chair introduced the second time. There's a paragraph introduced item number three on the agenda. The second line after 9 p.m., there needs to be a period. Okay. Do you see that? Yes, I do. I'm going to have to change it in on this computer. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. That's, that's it. Okay, great. Thank you, Jean. Um, so is there a motion to approve the April 7th, 2022 meeting minutes as amended? So motion. Is there a second? Second. Uh, we'll take a roll call vote, starting with Ken. Yes. Jean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Steve? Yes. yes. And I'm a yes as well. So the meeting minutes from April 7th, 2022 have been approved as amended. Uh, let's see. So um, at this time, we could start the hearing and start with the department. Uh, any update from the department? Unless you want me to run out and see if they're waiting downstairs are we still I waiting saw, for a few I, people i saw attorney and sc stick his yeah hand. me too oh why I don't we do that why don't we take actually. the next couple minutes and round up the applicants let me quick check that would be great we'll just take a quick pause so uh good evening for those of you just joining us um for those of you who are uh planning on presenting as part of docket number three zero 3704 18 to 20 belknap street um if you wanted to join us at the table we can certainly help Move so we arranged some some chairs. If 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 you're uh, one of the presenters, one of the applicants, we just would like them to sit at the table. Yeah, I think that's helpful. Sean? Sean? Okay. Hi, Sean, thank you for joining us. We wanted to just see if that um, placement of the microphone would work for all of the applicants. Great, thank you so much, I appreciate it.
Great. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, so at this point, we'd like to move to agenda item number two, the continued public hearing for docket number 3704, 18 to 20 Belknap Street. Um, so uh, Attorney Nessie, we're glad yes, to see you back you. with us. Good but before, before you do start, what I'd like to do is I'd like to turn it over sure. to, to Kelly um, for any update that she'd like to provide sure. for us from the uh, memo from the department. Sure. Um, so just as a reminder to anyone who may be new here or who wasn't at the prior hearing, um, the applicant is seeking a special permit for re a resi residential renovation with, for a property that has some existing prior, pre-existing nonconformance rights. Um, and then we have uh, two reasons for the special permit, the first being the use, um, because the, it, and again, this goes back to the discussion about prior pre-existing non-conformance rights. Even though this is in an R2 district, um, the property was developed in the 1920s before zoning bylaw as a, as a four-family structure and then illegally converted to a six-family and then brought back to, by this applicant, its prior legal non-conforming use. Um, and then the other reason for a special permit would be for the size. So in the last hearing, um, the board had asked for a number of clarifications, um, including a site plan, uh, many clarifications regarding some of the dimensional details. The applicant has responded, providing updated site plans um, with dimensional details, um, with building footprint dimensions, with uh, their calculations of the floor area ratio, the FAR, um, as provided on sheet. A04 and A07. Um, they, uh, I had noted that um, building heights had not been provided, but the applicant um, pointed out to me that they had, uh, the surveyor had provided a roof peak height of 33.8 feet in his as built calculations on the site plan. So I, I need to open that up again just to take a look because I think it's, it's somewhere off to the side and I wasn't able to see that in my review. Um, they also had clarified the definition, whether the property conforms with the definition of a um, half story. And so they amended the third story to show that less than half of the square, <laughs> less than half of the floor area on that third floor, of the second floor floor area, less than half of that is provided at a height of seven feet or more on the third floor. And then they also demonstrated that the, <laughs> roof slope had did meet the minimum requirement of two to, of a ratio of two to 12. Um, there were a number of additional updates. They had provided a location for a bike parking pad and I've clarified back with the applicant, provided a copy of the bicycle parking guidelines so they can understand the types of short-term and long-term bicycle parking that is approved through the zoning by bylaw. Um, and they also uh, clarified to me via email today that the crushed stone buffer for the usable floor or the usable open space in the rear yard, the buffer is five, five and a half feet. Um, the one thing that I was not able to determine is that they had met the requirements for a parking buffer. So it still looks like the parking area is uh, directly adjacent to the parcel line, um, both in the rear and in both side yards of the parcel. <clears throat> Other than that, they have provided clarification of the dimensions that were requested by the board. Great, thank you very much, Kelly, I appreciate it. This time, I'd like to turn it over to uh, you, Attorney Anessi, and uh, your colleagues who are here with you this evening. Good to be here. Thank you. Uh, I have a procedural question uh, Please. before we start. I note that Mr. Revelick is not here, and he was here for the first hearing. How he, is this going to work now? He is actually joining us uh, remotely. Oh, he is. Yep. So he's participating so, in the hearing. He is. Steve, if you'd like to say board. hi. Steve. Thank you, Steve. There he is. <laughs> All right, good to, good to hear. Yes. Uh, good. <laughs> Underwater, but here. Uh, we have tried our best to respond to the questions posed to us uh, by the board. And uh, as Kelly has indicated, uh, we've given written uh, uh, submissions to the members of the, uh, the board with respect to many of those requests. Uh, Chris Manning is going to talk about some of the other items on that request list at this point uh, for the education of the uh, members of the ARB. Go ahead, Chris. Testing. 
Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, would you like me to go through um, all of the notes that Kelly provided or any am ambiguities or questions that had arisen from? I think, um, again, from the memo that Kelly provided, if there was anything that she questioned is whether or not um, that information had been provided, if you could top line that for us, that would be very helpful. Certainly. <clears throat> so regarding building height dimensions, Kelly addressed the fact that it was on the survey. Pardon us for not providing that on the actual floor plan. Um, today we, uh, we briefly emailed about uh, details of the bike rack. Um, we had never provided a bike rack before, so we were almost uh, deferring to the board for that. And if you would like us to provide any specific kind of fixture, we will. Sounds like a U-shaped, um, a reverse U-shaped bike rack would be amenable, and we're happy to provide that. On the um, site plan regarding screening, and this is more of a question um, that I posed to um, my attorneys because I, I I admit that I'm, I'm not so well versed in the bylaw um, and I'm just I'm still learning a lot of this uh, I noticed that the five to six foot high fence um, essentially requires the five foot setback and what I had done is I had I had gone through the bylaw to try to do my best to understand that on my own um, I found exceptions to that in 6.1.1 D um, Exception, excuse me, exceptions to 6.1.11D um, in Section E. And what I was posing to my attorneys here was whether or not we, um, our situation applies for that, ex uh, uh, complies to that exception or qualifies for that exception. Um, when I looked through it, it says the landscaping standards can be modified um, if, as long as two conditions are satisfied. Um, as findings of a special permit. Um, one is reasonable alternative measures have been taken to meet the intent of these standards. Um, I do have a, a printout here if, if, if anyone would like one um, regarding parking lots. So uh, that we've tried to minimize traffic congestion entering and within parking lots. Uh, we've separated parking from pedestrian spaces. We've provided adequate drainage um, and we, we've screened parking lots from adjacent residential uses and from street frontages, um, preferably with landscape spaces, and facilitate snow removal and storage. Um, I feel like we've, I, I mean, I, I know in my heart, as a member of the team, that we've done our best to reasonably accommodate um, these stipulations uh, without even ever seeing them before we try to, try to accommodate those. Um, number two is all landscape space required by this section is provided at some location in the parking lot, including required landscaping which may be lost in setbacks reduced in size by the provisions of this subsection um, um, it seems like we have based on the survey more than enough usable excuse me um, landscaped open space to accommodate that when I did the math of um, the five foot buffer on the left side of the lot the rear side of the lot, and the right side of the lot um, adjacent to those parking spaces I measured approximately 350 square feet and um, if if you see on the site plan, we have a lot of landscaped area, uh, including the usable open space and space on the front of the lot that I feel um, accommodates that. And we were hoping that we would, again, um, that we would qualify for that exception. Um, we, the, light, the lot is very tight. I mean, there's, there's really no way to accommodate that five foot setback just based on the open space we need to provide or that we're, we're trying to provide, the parking that we're required to provide. and. Uh, we're hoping that the board would be amenable to that. So I might also point out what you're coming from, what this, you know, the improvements we made over what was existing before. Correct. That's a good point. Um, as Don pointed out, we're coming from a completely paved parking lot before. Previous to this, there was not one bit of uh, green space or per permeable area on the lot. When you drove to the, to the rear of the property, um, you had a, a, a two-car garage, and the rest of it was, it was bulkheads, it was a fire escape, but the entire area was paved uh, with bituminous impervious asphalt. Was there any screening to the neighboring properties? Um, nothing that doesn't exist. Uh, there's nothing, there was nothing uh, existing on the left side of the lot 
up into the vinyl fence of one of the neighbors. There's a, an open chain link fence um, between the flat end of the lot and the slope down to the bike path. And there are chain link fence on the, on the fences on the right side of the property. But there is no screening, as far as I can tell, per the bylaw, and uh, no shrubbery. Uh, maybe some shrubbery on the right side of the lot, more of an overgrowth, um, but nothing by design. Nothing by design that would screen parking in any way. Thank you. Uh, Kelly also covered the dimensions of the buffer area around the, uh, the usable open space. We are totally open to uh, any kind of type of shrub species if the ARB has recommendations. We would likely use some kind of native species that's readily available, that doesn't grow too tall, uh, that would provide a nice tasteful perimeter to that open space. Um, we're happy to take any, any recommendations, any referrals at all, but we'll, we would defer to our uh, uh, landscape designer, our landscaper on that. Um, something that's readily available that would, that would um, live through the four seasons, you know, that would be uh, perennial in nature. And then uh, details of the modified fencing, I felt like we should address that. I mean, we, we've done a few different projects and right now we didn't provide specifics because we're toying with the idea of doing um, a modified uh, wooden fence on the front that has more open slats to it. Um, something that's short, um, I don't want to you know, necessarily speak out of turn because I'm not the one who actually builds the fences, but we're thinking three to three and a half feet um, I did see another design just yesterday that was more of a wrought iron look, and it's almost completely open. Uh, it just has those slats. We just want to provide some privacy and some security if the new residents have pets or children or something like that without it being obtrusive to the neighbors. So um, we're open to suggestions, and um, we, uh, we, it was great because it, um, this item made us think a little bit more about that. You know, So thank you for that. I believe that I've addressed those items. Kelly, can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Great. Thank so you. We're open to questions from the members of the uh, ARB. Uh, John and I are both here for uh, any questions that may come up that uh, are within our purview. Uh, and Chris, of course, is here with respect to design and architectural and the like. So. Great. Thank you very much, and I appreciate you returning this evening um, and sending these updates ahead of time. Much appreciated. Um, so at this time, I'd like to turn it over to the members of the board for uh, any questions regarding the updated um, plans and application materials that were received, starting with Ken. All right. Um, thank you for uh, sending that information back to us. Based on uh, your s civil engineer, giving the elevation of the top of the roof. Uh, I calculate, and I want you to confirm that, that from ground level up to your top of your roof, you're at 34 foot, four inches. Is that what, because it doesn't say that. You, you give me the elevation from grade and all this stuff. So I had to sit there and do some math. Uh, it's actually 33.8 feet. So the way the surveyor does it was confusing to me at first too. They they measure um, using the first floor. Thank you, Sean. Reminded me to please um, to please move the microphone towards the speaker. I have thank one you, job tonight, and I neglected it. <laughs> I appreciate that's a very important job. Can we ask yes, what, 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 what page? Yes, if you could please, uh, is there a page in the application materials that you can refer us to? Yes, it's the actual survey. Um, which has some existing conditions as well as proposed conditions on it. Sure. Kelly, do you know what page that is in the package? That is, um, is this the one that has the parking on it? Yes. Yeah, so that is the, it's um, 18 to 20 Belknap in all caps, Belknap Arlington. It's 46 of 575, if you guys. Oh, it's. Oh, so, okay, got it. It was, in, it was in the first package? It was in the first package. Oh, in the first package, okay. Right? Well, no, actually, I think Kelly's right. It's, it's a standalone document. It's a standalone document. Yeah, in the um, agenda materials for tonight. Right, deleted, or dated July 18th? 
Yeah, and it's all Belknap, all in caps. Great, thank you very much. It's it's pretty challenging to see um, under elevations on the left side. You'll see a roof peak from average grade. It's 133.8, um, which is for in surveyors language is 33.8. I don't pretend to be an engineer, but that's how they that's how they do it in any of our other surveys that we've had. All right, because I didn't look at that. How I got there is the, the roof pitch uh, uh, from first floor is uh, 130.5. And you're assuming uh, the first floor elevation is 100, so I'm saying from the first floor to uh, roof pitch is at uh, 30.5, which is 30 feet 6 inches. Then I go back to your... Um, your, your building section, your building section calls it off as three foot ten from f top of first floor to grade. So if I do the math, it's 33, 34 foot four inches. That's how I got there. So, and then I looked at what you said at 33.8, mm -hmm. something's off. So I just want a clarification which. Sure. Is, is, is more accurate. I, I, I'm not saying one or the other. I just, it doesn't make sense to me right now, okay? okay. If you can tell me which is, which is the one to go by. It goes by, um, this surveyor is using, um, he points out that the lot is sloped more than 5%, and on a slope of more than 5%, the average grade of the lot is used. Yep. Um, so you're saying to go by the survey dimension? That's the most accurate. Yes. Okay. okay. Great. Then if that's true, you're saying and stating that it's uh, 33 feet, 8 inches to top of peak. Well within the 35 feet. 33.8. But it's well within the 35 feet that's uh, yes. which is done by zoning. Yes. Okay. And Rachel said it better than I, I, I just, than I did. When I did the math, it just didn't make any sense to me. And that's, I get it. But by you get saying that the, the, the surveyors. The thing is sloped, and there's, he's taking an average of the slope, the highest and the lowest. Okay, I can see where that might come in. Okay. Um, and then if I can go back, stay on the same page, and if I can go back to just uh, the parking lot. Um, oops. Um, you have this five foot six crushed stone. Is that part of your open space? Yes. Okay. So, and you're, so are you asking for relief um, from the fence to the cars on the side yard and the rear yards? Or you're saying that it's not required? That's. I feel like my attorneys are more qualified to handle that question than me. It seemed to me, based on the exception, that it was not required. Um, we certainly don't have the buffer on the fence lines. Sure. Sure. So I can chime in briefly on that. And Chris, Chris touched on it a little bit in his original presentation. Again, Don Bornstein, uh, attorney Johnson and Bornstein, 12 Chestnut Street, Andover. Um, I represent the applicant. The, um, Chris had pointed to section 6.1.11, subsection D, e. E, yeah, and it goes down to E, and it provides for, so there's a built-in, we'll call it a waiver, an exception, whatever you want to call it, there's a built-in way for the board to make findings to reduce or eliminate that five-foot setback, a five-foot, um, um, you know, distance between the fence and the, uh, the the neighboring property and so I think Chris explained in his in his opening statement the ways in which we've met that test I think alternatively the board could also just elect to waive it with the under the standard that we talked about at the first session which it, this being an alteration of a pre-existing non-conforming use Chris provided the facts for that which is the rear of this property was basically paved out to the edges there was limited or very little screening this is uh, I think um, difficult to argue that this is an improvement over that and certainly not substantially more detrimental. So the board could elect to waive it by finding this, the change in that respect is not substantially more detrimental 
or the board can make the finding under 6.1.11 E that um, that we've met all those things. Basically, we've done the best we can. That, that's what I look at that standard as. We've done the best we can and, and we've met sort of the purposes that that five foot provides. We've met it in other ways on the lot. So I think you could do it either way. Okay. And this is my last question and then uh, I'll let the rest of the board ask. Um, on your site plan there, uh, you show a six foot high <clears throat> privacy fence. Uh, where does it start and where does it end? Unfortunately, surveyors are not. I'm sorry, could you? Thank you. Surveyors are not um, the best designers. Um, you'll see that the privacy fence is donated by X's. Um, okay. And so we're start. Should I just point out on the. Uh, over yeah. Here? Um, uh, what, we, since we have someone joining us remotely, if you could um, describe, that would be sure. helpful. So as I drive down the driveway um, on the left side where you see the 147 foot marker, Mm. Uh, that's a building. The building ends approximately where the first X is denotated, and that's the beginning of the fence. That's the approximate area. I told him I want the fence to start at the neighboring building and go between the two parking areas to the rear lot line, across the rear lot line, to the right, forward, all the way until we get to, you see the 3.1 measurement there. Um, and that'll stop there and cut it, most likely cut into the building at a 90 degree angle. And the rest will be open and or um, low fencing for the front yards. Great. Okay. So the fence starts, I, 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 I understand it, okay. Because I couldn't tell by your X's and whatever or the right. lines, <laughs> there's no indication of where that started or ended. Right. Um, so the lowest uh, X on either side planned south. Yes. It's a start. Okay. On both sides. Yes. You okay with that, Steve? You, you, did you hear that? Steve, your audio seems to uh, have cut out. Can't hear you. I'm done with my questions for okay. Rachel. Okay, uh, while you work on your audio issues, we're going to move to Jean. Thank you. I, just follow up I have some questions about the disparities between your application that you submitted initially and the materials you submitted for tonight. So I want to walk you through and I'd like an explanation for each one. Um, in your first application, You're propo you proposed the first floor to have 2,382.04 feet. In the revised application, it's 2,229 feet, about 150-odd feet less. Please explain the disparity between the first floor in the first application and the first floor in the second application, and which is the correct amount? Sure. Uh, the disparity is on the first floor is uh, the fact that we originally had bump outs on the first floor in the middle uh, as two mudrooms, and on the rear of the building as two mudrooms. Uh, I, I, I'd be remiss if I could tell you exactly the square footage. Um, but it would be approximately, I'd say, about 100 square feet, 100, 100 to 200 square feet, because I remember some of the dimensions being five to six feet. Um, and we abandoned those mudrooms. So we abandoned the mudrooms on the front. We realized that we would be in violation of the front setback. And we've, we abandoned the mudrooms on the rear uh, since we ended up in a situation where we were discussing FAR with um, potentially one board or the other in Arlington. So between our first hearing and this hearing, you've revised the plan yes. for the building. Of the second floor, the initial application had um, 2,223 square feet, and this one has 2,200. 
29. Can you explain that for the second floor? That is not something I can readily explain. Um, it's six square feet. I imagine that could, that could almost come from anywhere um, in terms of maybe slight changes to the floor plan. I wish I had an answer for that, but I, the only thing I can think of is that we may have modified. I, I do remember modifying the front of the building um, where the decks are. And well, I'm, so, we're good. I'm going to need an explanation that shows the difference between the two. And I'd like something that shows for the first floor, the before and after also. Okay. We um, did submit a, a plan with um, the proposed in the initial packet that showed the bump outs on the first floor. And they're gone from the second packet? And they are not there on the second packet. Um, the bump outs in front? The, the mudrooms on the front. So the enclosed mudrooms, they were actually living area on the front and the rear of the building. Mm -hmm. We've abandoned those. Can, Kelly, yeah, can, can yeah, you um, put up the first floor plan? Well, I think it's the next page. I think that's the second floor. Sorry, I'm trying to read this here. And okay, here's the first floor here. Can you go up there and show us what's been changed? Sure. Please. This is basement. This is first. Um, actually, it's almost the same shape as you can see these two lines in between the building, the dividing line between the building here. We've got two mud rooms. Approximately in the same area that bumped out here, and they were enclosed, so they were living area. So oh, I'm sorry, the microphone's not going to be able to to pick you up from there. So. Um, okay, you can go yeah. sit down now. Thank you. So in the area between the two sure. front porches that you see now, that was were, enclosed before, prior. That was enclosed before. There was a one-story. Um, area there that was divided into two mudroom foyer entry areas. And those mimicked the ones that were on the rear of the building. They were essentially the same uh, design. Okay. In the um, first application for the current situation, you had zero for the basement. And you, in response to my question, you said the basement was only used for mechanicals and there was really no living space and nothing in there. In the revised application, it shows 1,963.74 feet currently for the basement. Can you explain the disparity between those two? Considering if it was only mechanicals under the bylaw, it should not be counted as gross floor area. Correct. And I misspoke because it was mechanicals and storage. So it was a regular New England style old school basement. We get pictures of that. Um, you know, the old field stone walls, open areas with mechanicals scattered throughout. Um, and the reason why we had zero uh, before was because I misinterpreted the bylaw where uh, I was reading language regarding stories and what applied and what didn't apply. And then you helped educate us on in the last meeting regarding what actually applied um, for the ARB to consider. Do you have anything that you can provide us to show that indeed the basement in the old building was used for storage, pictures, affidavits from former residents, something of that nature? so sure. that we can credit it with a number. And, and a, a diagram of the basement that showed the part that was mechanicals and the part that was storage. And, and the reason I'm asking this is because you're asking for an increase in the gross floor area from the old current to the new. And in order for us to determine 
whether to do that and what it would be, we need to know with accuracy what the gross floor area was in the building before you owned it, basically. So um, we need to see that. Let me go to the um, attic now. Um, and both of your numbers for the attic, I find difficult to believe, okay? Because you say currently, well, your proposal will have 1,112 feet in the attic, gross floor area, but you claim now, before you got the building, it had even more, 1,247 gross floor area in the attic. And I know you've done a lot to make the attic larger, and if my colleagues can take a look at the material that I suggested be added to the record, there's a photo of the building before they started working on it, and there's just a little dormer window in front and a hip roof. And if you look at the, um, the property card for that, which still has the old building on it, you'll see that the um, <clears throat> attic, upper attic, 421 square feet in the property card for the upper attic. So I'm wondering how we got from in the neighborhood of 421 square feet for the attic before you started working on the building to what you now say was 1,247.34 square feet in the attic before you started working on it. Sure. It seems like, I mean, I've noted, I've been a real estate agent and a developer for a while, and I've no, and an appraiser in my lifetime, and I've noticed public record is great for general reference, but it's also not always accurate. Um, on page A, A03 of the new plan that we submitted, which is, ex, uh, excuse me, A04 of the existing conditions that we submitted, um, the architect notes 1,247. 0.34 square feet in the attic. I mean, there were these were four apartments, uh, excuse me, there were six apartments, and I, re I recall being up there. I, I've toured this building myself. I've, we can address the basement, no problem, as well, and the attic as well, and we've walked up there. I mean, you can see that they had two bathrooms and kitchens and bedrooms up there. Um, it, was, it was fully used as an, as an attic, as a finished attic prior to our purchase. I, do, I don't understand how you could expand the third floor and yet end up with less square feet than was there before. You need to explain that to me, how that happened. It's, for us, um, I guess the easiest way for me to simplify the answer, you know, the way that I, the way that I think of it, is there's a half story definition in Arlington, as we all know, and the half story requirement is such that the area that's counted to a GFA is above seven feet, and the area that's not counted to a GFA is below seven feet. And there are creative ways to create space, um, to, to add space to a, a third floor, to make sure that we comply and that we have a generous amount of area for storage and mechanicals and such. Um, you know, we've, we've consulted with our architect and we've, we've done the measurements. We've actually had um, ISD in the building, so Mike Champa himself has been through the building and, and measured the, uh, the half story as well, at least you know, generally with the tools that they have. I wasn't there, but my team was. Um, I mean, in my own observation, my own experience, and uh, I likely, I mean, I don't know if I have pictures. I don't want to promise that I have pictures of the third floor. I know I have pictures of the basement. I like to take as many pictures as I can. It was very much a quote unquote, um, what I consider a full story, full, fully used story. It might have qualified for a half story, but. Yeah, I think I'd need to see pictures or, or something of the like um, to, to be comfortable with the number that you've put in here. And let me see if I understand. The way you're saying this, if I understand you correctly, is your, your proposed building 
has an attic of 1,112 square feet because you're not counting any area where the ceiling is less than seven foot high? Is that what you're saying? In our GFA. In your, in your gross floor area. So if we were to count in your gross floor area anything that's under seven feet, what would be the GFA for the attic? Um, I don't have that overall calculation, I don't think. I have to double check the numbers. Okay, now, when, when I look, well, well, yeah, you'll need to get back to us on that. When I look at, and I'm not sure that's right, by the way, and I'm going to need to sort of take a look and see whether anything that's under seven square feet in the attic is not counted as GFA. And if it's not counted as GFA, I'm not sure you're allowed to have it as livable space. So we'll need to talk to the building inspector about that um, to straighten that out in trying to figure out what the GFA was before and what the GFA is that you're proposing. Because looking at the roof line of that building, if you're claiming that things under seven feet high are encountered as GFA, it seems to me that most of that attic before probably wouldn't count as GFA. So you're going to have to help out with that too. Um, pretty steeply pitched um, hip roof. And I'd suggest that much of it was not seven feet high. So we need to fix, understand what the GFA was on the building before and what the GFA is that you're proposing. Um, in addition, just for general knowledge, you can't count the garage toward the GFA um, of the previous building because it's pretty clear under the rules that an accessory building used for transportation is not counted. So the 448, 68, which is pretty close to accurate size of the garage, is not counted toward the GFA of the previous building. Um, I just want to, oh, I should have mentioned this to my colleagues. When, when we last um, had the meeting, we had a discussion about um, wanting to find out how the Zoning Board of Appeals would look at this. And at the time, Rachel said she would contact Christian Klein, the chair of the board. But afterward, Rachel and I spoke, and I agreed that I would contact Mr. Klein. And I had a conversation with Mr. Klein about this. And in brief, this is what he told me, how the Zoning Board of Appeals would look at this. Um, they would look at this under 8.1.4, non-conforming structures other than single family or two family dwellings. If it were a single family or a two family dwelling, they could, within the confines of 8.1.3, increase the non-conforming nature if it won't be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. However, according to Mr. Klein, that's not the standard you use for things that are more than two, two family buildings. You look at 8.1.4, and there's nothing in 8.1.4 that would allow the structure to further violate the dimensional and density regulations of the district in which it is located, which basically means the way that they would look at it is that um, you could not increase the FAR beyond what the FAR was in the previous building because the FAR for this building is maxed out at 0.35. The other building was more than 0.35, although we're not clear what it actually was. But the proposal cannot exceed the FAR of what the current building was at the time. So what Mr. Klein said is that the um, applicant would 
under his view of what happened if the ZBA got it, and of course he couldn't speak for the rest of the ZBA, the applicant would either have to meet the FAR of the old building or would have to ask for a variance to increase the FAR of the old building. Um, so that's true for that, and of course it's also true for um, open space, both landscaped and usable, in that they cannot have less landscaped open space or usable open space than the previous building had, or else they are also increasing um, the nonconformity. So the other thing that we need to find out is what was the usable open space and what was the landscaped open space in the previous building so we have something to compare it to. So I'll now go in to um, what was the open space in the old building. Now, some of you may have seen, and, and if there are people here who know this, when it's time for the public to speak, I would love you to say something about this. We, um, I'll, I'll let you speak in a moment. <laughs> All right, um, thank you. We um, got an email from Mr. Don Seltzer, who included a um, overhead photograph of the property that was taken in the year 2020. And in the overhead of the property taken in the year 2020, have you seen it? Yeah. Have the people at the table seen it too? Can Kelly, can you put that up on the screen? Um, let me see. It was added and um, this came in today. So it's listed in court. I, I know it's when we get things late, um, that's why Kelly's going to pull it up. I don't expect you to have, and I don't expect you to have Amen seen it. today, we're being ambushed. We've never Nobody, seen it. No, no, this no, is no, not no. coming from the board. Yeah. This is coming no. from an email that we received today. So that's why we're pulling it up. Nobody is trying to right. ambush you or anything else. It's right. just correspondence that was received. Right. The email from Don? Don yes. Seltzer. It's near no, the not end. It's near the end. end. There it is. That's, that's it. Mr. Seltzer claims that this was the way the property looked in back in the year 2020, and um, the whole area in back of the garage was green space and not paved over, and that the owner of the building paved over the space sometime between that photograph in 2020 and now, because I did a Google Maps in a few look at Google Maps, which is now 2022, it shows it looks like brand new hot top. So um, I'm just wondering if you were aware that there was this green space in the backyard prior to or in the year 2020. Absolutely not. Okay. I've never seen that before. Okay. Um, let's go to the front yard then. If I remember correctly from the last meeting, and correct me if I'm wrong, you've basically pulled up the building five feet toward the front lot line beyond what it was before. Is that fair? I mean... I'm not the one who actually constructed it. I've got my team here, but uh, it sounds about right. From, but, but it depends on where you're measuring from. Okay, go, we, go ahead. We had different sections of the building. So the building comes up to, <clears throat> there's an edge of the building, then there are bay windows, and then there were porches and stairs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. But I didn't measure, I didn't measure the actual additions myself. I believe that they were about five feet each. Okay, because, and, and I'm, I'm not questioning that what you've said in the revised application <coughs> is that um, you have landscaped open space of 1,467 square feet and usable open space of 1,000 428 square feet, but I didn't see 
anywhere in your material a chart that broke that chart. <coughs> so I tried to figure this out, and you've got about. Could you repeat those numbers again? I didn't. Well, I, I couldn't hear from, you on the numbers. This is from your. No, no, revised, I'm asking the numbers you just said. Revised application. Um, you claim that you're going to have 2,376 usable square feet and 2,090.07 land I'm sorry, someone just coughed over the 2,090.07. And, and you don't have any chart showing me how you came up with those two numbers. Now, I tried to figure it out, and I see you have the little square in the back by the parking, 1,350 square feet. So that's, you know, partway there, but I couldn't figure out how you got to the rest of it. So can you tell me how those numbers were calculated? Yes. Um, the way that I got the usable open space number mm -hmm. was uh, on page A, 07 of the, um, the floor plans that we submitted. There are calculations, and I apologize for not delineating the, op the usable open space versus the landscaped. Uh, the rear proposed uh, green space is Wait, the way that. Wait, which, which page is it on? It's page 7 out of 16 on the revised plans that we received okay. with today's application. Thank you. Here. You're welcome. Okay. So what we've done is we have proposed. It's, they, they label it as proposed green space, but it's usable open space in the rear of 1422.01. In the front, we've got usable open space of 954.5. I added those two numbers together to come up with the 2376.51. And if the landscaped open space is also a question, I added those two numbers as well as the 193.56 on the right side of the building. To come up with? With the, to come up with the, oops, excuse me. What did I do there? Oh, you know what? I subtracted um, the pat, the, the, what I saw as walkways in the front yard to come up with the 2,090.07. I estimated those walkways to be four feet wide each, so eight feet by, um, there's a measurement. On the so you survey. added in the side and then you subtracted out the, the walkways. Uh, hardscaping. Yes, thank you. Got it. Just for clarification going forward, can we all agree to drop the point, um, the portion of the square foot? Maybe we can, if we're, if we're talking in thousands, we would use four places rather than six places. So we're just. I, I was just, I, I'm happy to do that. I was just repeating what was in the materials that were presented we can, to us. I think we'll all accept as accurate that we'll just stop at the decimal. That's fine. And Gene, are you satisfied with that explanation? That makes sense. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay. Can, can you then explain how on the original application you indicated that current was 1,268 square feet of landscaped open space, 1,268, but in your revised application, and I'm leaving out the decimal, 727. So it went from 1268 to 727. Can you explain the disparity between your initial application and the current application for the current conditions? I hadn't subtracted the walkways in the front. And I didn't have the um, I actually didn't have all of the existing, all of the existing measurements and the proposed on the same exact plan. But and it was probably, know, I, I can only account that to my error. Open space landscaped includes walks and terraces. That's the definition. So you're not supposed to be subtracting out walks. Okay. Even if it's concrete um, impervious? Okay. I, I, and that was one of my, my biggest errors in the, 
in the understanding of this whole thing with usable open space. So and what, what I would like you to do, and my colleagues might disagree with me, and, and Kelly might get upset at me, but I would like you, between now and the next hearing, if there is a next hearing, to try to work with Kelly or with Mr. Champa so that, you know, Kelly or Mr. Champa and you come to a current understanding of what was the open space, what you're proposing to be the open space, what was the gross floor area, and what you're proposing to be the gross floor area. Because there's too much discrepancy, too much shifting sands for me to be comfortable with this at the moment. Um, I'll, I'll save the rest for our discussion. Okay. That's it Thank you, Jean. Uh, Steve, do you have your audio? Perfect. You sound great. So if you have any questions for the applicant, if you could um, please address those at this time. Yes, I, um, I do have a brief question, but I'd also like to um, uh, make a couple of um, just to share some of my experiences experiences on the ZBA uh, regarding uh, a couple of the areas that Mr. Benson mentioned, uh, because I, I think um, it might help to clarify some of them. Uh, so, starting off for questions with the app for the applicant um, between the first iteration and the second iteration, the outer part of the roof um, went from having a one to twelve slope to a two to twelve slope. Is that a was that a correction or is that going to be uh, or was one to twelve an as built number and two to twelve will be a modification? The latter, one to twelve was okay. A, per a permitted as built and two two to twelve is a modification. Okay, so two to twelve is a modification. All right. And regarding uh, so let's see, is the which sheet is this? This is on sheet A zero seven. In the plot plan, and I'll give the folks in the room a chance to bring that up so we can all look at the same thing. Uh, there are two dimensions shown in the front part. Uh, 20, it looks like 25.3 feet to the um, front exterior wall, and then there's also a 20 of uh, a front exterior wall of the old, the old what used to be the front exterior wall. And the, there's also 23 feet from the front lot line to the um, new, new wall. Now is there, where, what is the setback of the, what's the distance between the front lot line and the porch? The front lot line and the existing porch or the new porch? Uh, the, both. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. The original porch, the existing porch, is 19.5, and the existing is 25.3. I'm looking at the survey. Um, the red lines are actually something that some of those. Carrie, it's on the new site plan they submitted in those dimensions that he's mentioned as on that you. plan. Yes, thank you. The standalone plan. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So the, so the distance between the front line, lot line, and the current porch is 19 and a half feet. And with the old porch, it was 25.3? Uh, reversed. So the original porch, it's, it's pretty busy in that front area. The original porch mm -hmm. um, setback is 19.5. Okay. And the car, because they... All right. Have, okay. Please continue. Go ahead and continue. He he felt like he cut you off. So oh no no that's ahead. fine. It's um it's just a busy area there, and I had them. I, I thought I was being smart by adding you know as much um, illustration as I could for paver walkways and such, and I feel like I confused the issue. Okay. So just um, in terms of the precedent, um, you know, and I'm having 
typically on when in my time on the zoning board of appeals when we would hear cases under five section 539 projections to minimum yards um, one of the things that the board would that we would typically ask the applicant was you know we'd, we'd ask them a series of questions to verify that the addition of a porch would not result in an open space nonconformity so although we you know our bylaw doesn't specifically say whether or not porches can be um, included in open space. Uh, my, you know, my, you know, experiences on the ZBA uh, would lead me to, to say that, no, we don't include them. Um, so I would actually say that there is no usable open space in the front of this property. Um, I mean, that 954 square feet is probably well you're uh, the it looks like it could be counting part of the porch and it could be counting part of the stairs neither of which should be counted um, but ultimately what you need for the growth flare area given is 780 square feet i suspect that you know if you take that what's on the side the 309 square feet in the you know immediately behind the proposed addition you probably i, I think there's a there's a high probability that um, you know, the, the landscape open space requirement is met. So with respect to usable open space, um, you know, the, although the dimensions are not called out explicitly on page A07, um, judging by the two 9 by 18 parking spaces, um, you know, that proposed green space of 1,422 square feet, uh, to, I would I would expect that to have a, a minimum horizontal dimension of 25 feet, which are you know bylaw requires. So I'm you know I'm convinced that that at least 1,422 square feet, assuming those are you know that that dimensional area is accurate, does does count as usable. Um, as my colleague said earlier, areas like patios, walkways, those are those are all you know perfectly good forms of landscaped open space. Now, with respect to, so yeah, is, is, for me, in terms of you know, the, the open space question, um, I, I think there is, I think you've probably complied with, with the landscaped open space requirement. Um, now, the question is whether or not there is a, um, there is a change in, you know, there, whether or not there was open space on the property beforehand and we're either adding more, reducing it, or so on. So back to the, um, back to the aerial photograph that uh, was in Mr. Seltzer's correspondence. Was, does, at the time the applicants purchased the property, did it look like that? No. The rear yard did not look like that at all. It was fully paved. It, did not look like that. it was fully paved with plastic right. asphalt. Okay. So yeah, I mean, I'm. I mean, if you so there's. I mean, although there may have been landscaped open space or usable open space in the lot behind, you know, at some point in the past, like 2020, um, is it is it fair to say that there was, you know, that space that space did not exist when you purchased the property, and meaning that there was no usable open space? Yes, in the rear of the. The, the property, that green grass, mm -hmm. that green grassy area was not there. It was fully paved, and from what I recall, it was relatively new, but it was okay. fully, fully paved. Mm -hmm. All right. So I mean, from in the you know, like with respect to you know having a non, having a nonconformity, I'm I feel comfortable in you know believing that there was no usable open space at the time you purchased the property. Uh, based on that and based on uh, what the setbacks you gave me for the uh, for the porch a minute ago um, so you're actually so you're you know you're not conforming but you're not increasing the nonconformity you're getting it closer to being conforming now with respect to gross floor area um, you know dirt, typically when the zoning board of appeals would hear stories for, or hear cases for half stories. As I re my recollection is that we counted GFA 
to be the area that was over seven square uh, over seven uh, feet. So that like the number that you would you know like that you know must not be greater than fifty percent. Whatever number that was, that was what we what we can uh, consider to be GFA and based um, landscaped and usable open space requirements on it. Um, the property card is sort of interesting. Um, I don't, I'm at a loss to explain why that has 421 square feet in the table, but uh, 1,685 square feet in sort of the, um, you know, the, the sketch uh, immediately above that. Uh, I don't know what the assessor is measuring, but I don't think, um, you know, I, I, can't, I can't make much sense of that one way or another. Um, so, but yeah, in, in terms of half stories, we would count, you know, at least my experience, on, my recollection of cases on the ZBA, you know, the area above seven square, uh, seven feet in height would be counted and the shorter areas would not. Um, with respect to the basements and the mechanicals, I mean, the, there is, um, you know, this, although the question of, you know, what part of the basement is used for mechanicals, uh, the by, our bylaw says, and, you know, this is 5322D2, basement area areas devoted exclusively to mechanical use as accessory to the operation of the building are to be excluded. Um, I don't know if, I don't know of any, you know, that we've had a, ever had a solid discussion about this, but, you know, a basement that was a combination of, you know, an open area where you might have a furnace over here, a hot water over heater over here, and some boxes and storage. You know, those, there are certainly mechanical uses in that, but there aren't areas that are exclusively devoted to mechanical uses. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm inclined to, you know, my first inclination, absent something to the default, something to, absent evidence to, con to the contrary, would be to assume that the entire basement, both before and after, would qualify as um, gross floor area. And let me see, do I have any other questions? No, I think the only other one I had was with respect to the uh, roof height, but that was clarified earlier. And um, I will turn it back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, Melissa, any questions or comments for the applicant? Um, just if you don't mind to remind me again the size of each unit. There's four units, correct? Yes. As it stands. Do you mind to tell me the total living square footage? Sure. That would be on page A07 and are you looking for area by floor or area by unit? Per unit? Per unit. Are they all about the same or the... Unit one. They're on. Uh, pardon me, this... Right oh, they're on my glasses. There. Okay. That's a little blurry. Um, I think I have it. 1866, yep. looks like. Unit yep. two, 1866. Right. You have it there. Are if you, you don't mind to repeat it, just for the record, because I'm trying to get a sense of each unit size based on a lot of the conversation we've had, kind of drilling down into gross square footage. Sure. Unit 3, uh, 2033, and unit 4, 2033. Okay. Thank you. Um, which I deem pretty, uh, you know, reasonable in terms of size and modest. I forget. What is the starter home again, Gene? 1850. 1850. So a little bigger than that, maybe, for a starter home. Um, I guess I wanted to just say um, I appreciate my colleagues' uh, attention to detail with regard to, you know, monitoring kind of what's been submitted and going forward. I think, um, you know, as a developer and real estate agent, maybe it's just kind of knowledge gained going forward with your projects. Uh, being attentive to these areas um, in my kind of my opinion based on what we're providing a special permit for I think um, it's all within reason so I'm you know leaning forward to support the special permit both for the um, the size related the open space and the gross uh, GFA I think um, 
you know, my issue was a little bit more on the very kind of how it was presenting with the, you know, the fencing. I think, Ken, you brought up um, the privacy fence, if that was, it was six feet, which is pretty standard. Yep. Okay. Um, in context, are there other fencings like that behind there, or would you be the first on this project to have a fencing six feet tall? Just curious. There is a vinyl fence that's at least six feet tall, in my opinion, um, that runs, I, I don't know the address, but it's on Marion Road, mm -hmm. and it, it, it comes across the, the property beside us, 1416, and, uh, and, and comes at an angle um, between, you know, into our lot, mm -hmm. it's about six feet, mm -hmm. approximately. Um, it's, we typically will use a six foot fence just for the privacy of the new residents. Um, it's not... Okay. It's not out of the question to drop it down. I read that it should be at least five feet mm -hmm. and no more than six feet. That's, I mean, and we just typically use a six foot fence. So that was, that's just our default with any kind of um, project. In there, and then there, is there access to the Minuteman bikeway since it's, you know, abutting there? No, there's is a that, solid chain link fence there. There's a grade differential. Is the well. grade differential. You don't want to go there. Yeah, you don't want to go there. Um, and I guess as it relates to the front in terms of the fencing in the front, you mentioned at the start of the meeting um, there was some wrought iron that you were looking at and something else. Um, I guess looking at the context of the house, I was looking at the other project that you presented earlier that had the stockade fencing and then you had the fencing or kind of barrier at the, um, I think it was the second or third level, the one that already exists that was developed. This one here? Yeah. Yes, 1315. Um, it's 1315 Belknap. It looks it has like some, you know, I would say the barrier on the top levels and the bottom level. If that could kind of start to, you know, if there was some relationship to those that you're going to be installing on this building, I guess what I'm trying to say is in relation to that, there's no relationship there to the right, stockade right. fencing and up what you did install. So in the proposed project, Mm -hmm. with any of the barrier fencing that you're putting on the balconies or porches for your consideration to put it around um, the perimeter there, if that's what you're proposing. I'm ashamed to say I haven't thought about that, and I love the idea. So, yes, we would absolutely like to do that. Um, we would aim to do that. So I think with that, you know, I, those are all my questions, and, you know, my concerns have been addressed through the conversation. Great. Thank you very much, Melissa. Um, I'm, uh, I don't have any further questions. I have some comments which I'll save for discussion amongst the board. Uh, so at this time, what I'd like to do, unless there are any other questions, is to uh, open this hearing up to public comment. We'll take public comment and then uh, return back to the board for our deliberation to identify whether or not we'll be able to get to a vote this evening. Okay. Uh, so at this time, I'd like to invite any members of the public who uh, wish to speak um, related to the new materials that have been presented this evening. Um, if uh, you'd like to speak, please raise your hand. You will be allotted up to three minutes. And I ask that you identify yourself by your first, last name, and address. Uh, when I call on you, please come up to the microphone here at the front of the room. Uh, is there anyone who'd like to speak this evening for this case? Please. All right. May I use some of this table? Oh, yes. Sure. Thank you. And again, if you could introduce yourself by your first, last name, and address. Sure. Thank you. I'm Austin Brown, and I'm a resident and representative of 10 Belknap Street. So um, is it all right if I ask a question and then make a statement? Absolutely. OK. So question number one is, so these guys have shown that on their updated plans, they're going to make a 2 to 12 slope and make, a, you know, make some height or whatever. I was wondering who's in charge of actually measuring the final structure? Uh, the building department is responsible for uh, confirming that the building has been constructed um, in compliance with the plans that will be revised and submitted. OK. All right. So number two is I actually went to the Arlington Public Library and I got a copy of the Massachusetts State Building Code. And I've been reading it. So unfortunately, it's not the most modern version. It's the seventh edition and the, and the ninth edition is the current one. But anyways, um, so. So on their plans, on the plans that these guys have um, shown, they did modify the top story to be uh, compliant with the 50% limit. Um, and in fact, I noticed that it was 
49.8% compliant, um, which is like, that's to within the inch, right? So, I mean, these guys are cutting things close. So also I'd like to talk about um, the bathrooms on the top floor. So in this version of the code, it says that the bathrooms, uh, uh, blah, 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 habitable, habitable rooms, corridors, bathrooms, must have a height of not less than seven feet. And so these bathrooms are less than seven feet. There's an exception though for a sloped roof. So it says that, okay, again, in this version of the code, you guys should check the most current version, I don't have access. But it says that not more than 50%, it's a, there's an exception for a sloped roof, You've, you're allowed 50% to be less than seven feet. The plans that these guys have submitted do not meet that. So maybe that's different in the more modern version, but you have to look at this. Um, if this is true, then these plans do not comply with the building code. Um, so this goes into sort of how a lot of neighbors, I think, are feeling. Um, there's been, as Mr. Benson said, a lot of sort of number fudging and things that just don't quite add up. Um, so for example, uh, on the first meeting, they just forgot about the basement and the FIR calculations, but they made sure to include the garage and other calculations. Um, they forgot about the two to 12 slope, which is, rookie mistake, like, what's going on there? Um, and there's been just a lot of number fudging in general. Um, it feels just very disingenuous, and I think that's why a lot of us neighbors are unhappy. Um, I would like the board to consider these feelings and their, their uh, decisions. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Uh, are there any other members of the public wishing to speak? Please. My name is Peg Abati Lenahan. I'm at 12 Belknap Street, longtime Arlington resident. Very grateful for your time and your concern and your attention. <clears throat> I'll hear technicalities from other people. I'd like to contribute the reactions of a neighbor. First, it feels the developers have not been acting in good faith. They measured the height starting at three feet off the ground. Nobody has mentioned that. The height was at the bottom of the first floor, which is th three feet off the ground, puts the total height more than the allowable height. They claim that the front of the building is in alignment with the front of the buildings on either side, but I can stand in my yard at 12 Belknap and look across 1460 and look to the front of their building. The mass of their building aligns with the open and airy porch of 1416. Creates a very different feeling in the front. Um, <clears throat> I can look at the, the third floor. Just common sense, it's not a half story. It's a massive third floor. They found a way to game the system. They found a way to cleverly get around the requirements. They're following the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law. Several neighbors met with the developers. We had a little sidewalk meeting at noon, the day of your last meeting, and the developers represented to us that the building department had followed, they had been there every step of the way, measured everything, left us with the impression that they were in full compliance. There was almost no reason to show up because there was no basis for appeal. I was shocked to find out that you, the board, had the same concerns, for example, about the third floor that we had. I honestly felt betrayed. I felt that, again, the developers were not acting in good faith. I feel that they have been both duplicitous and disingenuous. Second, <clears throat> the building is simply too big. It encroaches too close to the sidewalk. The third floor is massive. It looms over us. The effect on me is to feel bullied by the building, to feel powerless at a time when, in the world at large, I think there's a tendency for, the, for citizens, for public democracy, to feel there are forces at work in the world that are too big for us. It doesn't help to have this massive bully of a building on our street and perhaps setting a dangerous precedent. In one way, it would be great if the board requires the, build, the builders to tear down and rebuild the third floor. It would create an important precedent for other builders or the same builder trying to wiggle around the code again. In another way, that would be wasteful and noisy. I wonder if the board could impose a fine so onerous that it would also serve as a precedent and the funds could be devoted to affordable housing, which we certainly support. Well, that's a big ask, so I'm gonna end with a small ask. Could you let us know how we can keep informed in a timely manner of the developments on this case? And thank you so much again for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any other members of the public wishing to speak? Please. Hi, thanks so much. My name is Beate Manstead. I'm living on Seven Marion Circles on the backside, so I'll see it square over through my yard. 
Um, I've been living there for a little bit over 20 years. I walk by on that house at least twice a day with my dog. And I remember in 2020 that the owner has paved all his driveway to the back newly because he refurbished the whole first floor, he put new appliances, and he wanted to rent it. So I guess he paved all the open space. I remember there used to be green space in the back next to this garage building. Um, I also noticed that the front now is much closer to the street. You know, there were these two green big patches where the realtor sign was, you know, the dog rolls around there. So I know exactly kind of how much space there was. And it definitely doesn't feel like that anymore. Um, also, I, I watched, I was not here the last meeting, I just watched uh, the, the video from ACME, and you know, someone said that it was not safe to walk by. I walked there by late at night with the dog at midnight alone in the morning. I never felt threatened at all there. Yes, the old building, you know, was not, you know, um, there were no tenants in there, so it felt a little desolated, but and it was, you know, not as beautiful, but I never felt unsafe in that area. That's what I just wanted to say. Thanks so much. Thank you. I'm just going to give you a copy. Thank you. Hi, my name is Deb Bermudez. Um, I live at 19 Belknap Street. Um, first, uh, something that's not in my prepared notes that I just need to say is that the crew that is developing this, this project is not new to development. They have done many projects. Chris pointed out that they haven't come before the board before. They're well respected in town. They know, you know, they know what they're doing. So it shocks me to hear some of the inconsistencies and some of the, oops, we just didn't know how the building code worked. Um, thank you for your thoughtful consideration of this project and of the concerns that are brought to your attention. I appreciate how challenging this must be for the board, as I understand your work is typically in consideration of projects in commercial or industrial areas with different issues. And thanks to ACME for providing video, which allowed me to see the proceedings last time since I wasn't able to attend. I submitted my input today with about the details of the projects, that many of the things that we've already discussed here tonight, but I wanted to take this opportunity to briefly speak to the concepts of value, benefit, and improvement when talking about neighborhoods. I've lived in Arlington and in this neighborhood for over 30 years, raised my family here, I work in the Arlington School Department. The investments that I and my family have made in Arlington as a town, and more specifically in this neighborhood, cannot be quantified with a dollar sign, and yet have enriched the community and supported Arlington's town goals and master plan that value community, neighborhood, diversity, and affordability. Asking if this project is, quote, of benefit to the neighborhood severely oversimplifies the issue. The idea that development increases property values has been mentioned as one positive, though in terms of that, my property values doubled in the past 15 years in the absence of large-scale development. And while updating maintaining, and maintaining a property certainly adds to the value, in referencing the decision criteria in Bylaw 3.3.3 that the board needs to consider, the addition of luxury condominiums is in no way, quote, essential to public convenience or welfare. According to some realtors, our neighborhood has been one of the most desired in Arlington for years, not because the buildings are all upgraded, but because of the community of people, the connection between neighbors, long-standing neighborhood events like monthly potlucks and the decades-long neighborhood circus each summer that makes people moving in feel welcome and engaged. Interestingly, Arlington's master plan talks about teardowns and mansionizations. It says, quote, high residential real estate values has led to demolition of smaller scale houses and their replacement with large houses out of scale with the existing neighborhood. Changes to setback requirements and floor area ratios might be considered to control the size and scale of replacement housing. Whatever you decide regarding this project, I hope you will weigh the impact on the neighborhood at least as much as the impact on the non-resident developers because the decisions you make as a board matter, and they set a precedent. They impact real lived experience of families who live in real neighborhoods, in real community with each other. This is not about whether we like the aesthetic, but if there are clear violations of building codes or bylaws that have been vetted by town meeting, even if they were approved in error, it's important that conditions be put in place to remedy those. Thank you again for listening and for your thoughtful consideration. Thank you. Are there other members of the public wishing to speak this evening? Please. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Chris Loretti, 56 Adams Street, and former member of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. I uh, came here tonight to primarily address the 11th hour memo from Council before your July 11th meeting. And there are a number of points I'd like to raise about it. First, I agree with Council that this project really doesn't belong before the ARB. The ARB only handles um, items that require a special permit. And this is not a special permit use in the R2, R2 zoning district and never could be. And therefore, it doesn't apply. And it doesn't apply, Section 8.1.8 of the bylaw doesn't apply either. Um, but having said that, it does and should be before the Zoning Board of Appeals. And the ZBA needs to make the finding that this is not significantly more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing nonconformity. And it also has to look at Section 8.1.4 of the Zoning Bylaw. And 8.1.4 is nonconforming structures other than single family or two family dwellings. That's what we have here. And what the bylaw says is any resulting alteration shall not cause the structure to further violate the dimensional and density regulations of the district in which it is located. That's absolute. If it, if it doesn't lead to that increasing violation, a variance is needed. My second point is the applicant incorrectly cites the Bovalta the Bolalta court case to try to argue that um, relief from the Zoning Board of Appeals or your board isn't needed at all. That's not right. Bolalta specifically applies to one and two family homes which get special treatment both under state law and under our zoning bylaw. It is completely irrelevant to a four unit apartment building. And you only need to read the first paragraph of the Bolalta decision to see that. Finally, the applicant also references Town Council's August 2020 memo to your board, which tries to argue that your board can grant relief and make exceptions to the dimensional um, requirements of the zoning bylaw, even when not specifically authorized by the bylaw. That's wrong, and he, he includes numerous errors of fact and law in his opinion. One of them is that section 40, I'm sorry, chapter A, section 49 of the Zoning Act um, provides for you to do just that, and it does not. What it says is that zoning bylaws may allow special permits to specify that or allow that, and ours does. It does that both for the ZBA and for the ARB, and it also states the maximum extent to which you can relax the standards. You can't go beyond that without a variance. Similar thing for parking. It applies both to the ARB and, and to the ZBA. It's got nothing to do with EDR. Town Council tries to argue that EDR allows you to relax the dimensional standards. It doesn't. EDR is very flexible with, result, with respect to the EDR standards themselves. You can relax them, you can waive them, but that does not give you the power to also waive or relax the dimensional regulations in the bylaw, unless the bylaw specifically says that you can do that. You're at time. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other members of the public wishing to speak this evening? Okay, at uh, this time we'll uh, go ahead and close public comment. Thank you very much for adjusting the microphone again. So at this time what I'd like to do is uh, turn it back over to the board. Um, I think we have a couple things to discuss and I'd like to throw out um, a few options. Um, I think that uh, Jean brought up a couple of really important points about trying to uh, better understand the gross floor area and thus the differential between the FAR and the existing building um, versus the newly proposed building. I think personally that is my biggest concern. I could um, see where I could get to um, a waiver of the buffer in the uh, parking area personally um, and for uh, some of the other items. Um, I'm also concerned about the, I'm still concerned about the half story space and I think specifically um, one of the uh, citizens who spoke this evening talked about the usability and the, um, the allowability of um, some of the uses that are proposed in the sub seven foot um, square footage of the uh, 
third floor space, which I think we should look into more. So one, uh, one option we have before us is to provide a list of items for the applicant to come back to us with um, in an additional hearing. One option we have is to identify the items that we may be able to prove to approve and if in fact under 8.1.4 we think that to extend any um, increase of the FAR we may send them to approve what we decide we can approve here and send them to the ZBA for a variance for the FAR if that's something that we decide to do. Um, and I'm open to other options. So, Ken, we'll start with you. Well, I'm, I, my, my question is <laughs> a little different from yours. Okay? Sure. Uh, as far as the actual factual FAR, I think because we're, we're reviewing this as the ARB and because it's under our jurisdiction, because it's along the bike path, just like any other project that was along Mass Ave or along Broadway, we're given a certain amount of um, uh, powers to give relief or not relief, to encourage development that we see fit in those areas. I like the fact that they reduced the, uh, the units from six units to four units, so it's less dense. Um, so. That's the part where I, <clears throat> I can see giving them a little relief on the FAR. The part about the height of the building and everything else, they made a, a, a story saying that's the height. I'm going to rely on the building commissioner to verify, and that's what they do. That's they're empowered. They're empowered to do that. I'm going to rely on them doing that, making sure that they comply with their number of uh, whatever they said that the, uh, the thing was. You know, so I have all the faith in Mike uh, uh, Champa from, uh, from doing that. The, uh, the issue that I have a little bit, I want, I want to talk to them about, are they willing to give a little, because I don't like the parking in the back. They shoehorn eight parking spaces in there, and I don't like that. I'm willing to give you relief on the number of parkings required per unit, but I'm asking you to relieve, give some, uh, to uh, eliminate some of the parking spaces and have more uh, um, buffer zones and stuff like that so you're not crowding your neighbors. Those are the three things I think are the main topics we're talking about. I think I'm open to either having them come back and uh, come up with answers for that or vote on it today. I'm, I'm, I'm okay to vote on that today. Uh, just based on what I said, and uh, I would probably vote on a positive for this based on what I've heard so far. So just to top line, we have FAR, we have the half story use. Yep. I'm, I was and we say. have the uh, buffer, the buffer slash parking. Correct. Okay. That's the only issue I have. The, I think the other two can be, uh, we can get relief on as far as the FAR, as far as the, the height, half story. I have all the faith in that the building uh, commissioner and, and uh, we, we, we would uh, follow through on that and make sure that's built correctly. Okay, thank you, Ken. Jean, your thoughts. I would not approve this if the FAR is greater than the far of the current building because of, and I said this last time, 8.1.4. I understand that we have the memo from town council that talks about our extraordinary powers, but I think that they are limited by looking at what are we trying to do. And what we're trying to do usually is in the business districts, the industrial districts, so this is very unusual for us. Um, and as I mentioned last time too, this has just the smallest little few feet of the backyard on the bike path. The great majority of the backyard backs on someone else's residential property. 
So it's just by dint of a few feet that it's here rather than at the ZBA. And I feel like it would be a mistake for us to handle this differently than we think the ZBA would handle it because this building shouldn't stand out differently somewhat simply because it has about four feet that border the bikeway. And, I, and can you put up that one, Kelly, Gene, please? I, I don't mean to interrupt you, okay, but. Let me, wait, I just want Which to show you the, the, yeah. the, um, the plot plan. Sure. That was, I sent over. I, I realize the, the fact that it's the four feet, but we. Wait, 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 let me, let me, let me finish, okay. please, Kim. I, so if you look, it's just, thank you. That's it. It's just the tiniest bit that backs on the bike path there. If, so let's say what I said doesn't make a difference and we treat this differently than the ZBA would treat anything else in this neighborhood because we have the authority under environmental design review. What are we trying to accomplish with environmental design review? And could we accomplish it if this had the same FAR as the existing building? And I would say, yes, it would. It would accomplish the same thing. So I would say, if we have the authority to do this, it's not the place to exercise the authority. So I, will, I would not agree to an increase in the FAR because I feel like I'm bound by 8.1.4 and what Mr. Klein said he felt the ZBA would do if it approached it. On the parking, if, well, if we uh, get, I mean, let me let, do let, the whole let's, thing. Let's just, On the parking, if, if we get to that, um, I, would, I would trade the buffers for fewer parking spaces as you're suggesting. Um, the, um, the warrant article that was passed in town meeting which will be effective very soon, would reduce the required number of parking spaces required here to four, right? And if we did some things which we haven't done yet, it would be in effect now because zoning bylaws can be in effect before AG approval. So I would be comfortable in trading off parking space reduction for some more open space and the buffer and the fence. So I agree with you on that one. I agree with you, I agree with you on whether the third floor violates the building code or not is really the building inspector's call. It's not our call to determine whether um, something violates the building code. I would certainly want something in our decision if we were to rule favorably to say it's contingent on the building inspector finding that you know, the third floor is proposed, meets the building code. Um, on the height, I think that's our responsibility first. And I don't know where to go from it because one of the, um, one of the uh, public members said, look, they're not starting from the ground. They're starting from two or three feet up. Did, they did address that, yeah, actually, they did. They did. That. And, so and that was that based on the very, they, they did add the three foot 10, <laughs> and that was, yeah. um, the height the is based slope. on the variable slope, the although, average. Although it wasn't clear to me, and maybe you can help me with this, it should just be the slope adjacent to the building, not the entire slope of the lot. Right? Correct, but so what I would also suggest we would do is add in a contingency there that the building inspector would need to, yeah, so then, agree. So I think I think we would have to do something about that um, with the height because we here can't figure out exactly what to do about the height yep. either. So, so those are my thoughts on it. And I, I, I think the far of the old building is going to be less than they said, at <laughs> least because they can't count the garage in the old building. That's very clear from the regulations. It's probably also going to be somewhat less than they said because I think they've significantly overcounted the attic. Um, so I of the original building. Of the original Correct. building. So I'd like to know what the original far should be, and I would limit the special permit to not exceeding the far 
the floor area ratio, excuse me, of the um, previous building. That's where I am on it. Thank you, Gene. Kim, did you want to reply before yes. I go to Melissa? The only thing I disagree with you, Gene, really, okay, is this, your statement saying that only four feet of the property is touching the bikeway. That's why we have to, that's why we should not give it the consideration we should. I've been on too many other projects where we're reviewing other projects, the same thing occurs, where there's an overlap of a property by a couple of feet or something like that, and we don't give it, say, well, you only touch it by a couple of feet, so your value to us is not, uh, your, your, your importance is not as important to us. If it touches, it touches, and you have to give it the same consideration. And I think what they said to uh, the zoning, uh, bylaws up where they say, okay, if it's on the bike path, it's on the bike path. I don't care if it's two feet or 20 feet or 100 feet. T tell me, if you're right, and let's say you're right, even if it's four That's feet. That's my opinion. I'm not I, saying I'm right. What part of EDR, and you're going to apply EDR, right? What part of EDR says that they should be able to increase the FAR? What does that get us in <coughs> any development any housing that they wouldn't get by keeping the FAR what it is, redoing this building, it's still going to be four units, there's still going to be expensive condos, they'll just be a little smaller, and the building will be slightly less massive. So even if I were to agree with you, and I would go down the EDR route, mm -hmm. I would come to the opposite conclusion. That's, that's perfectly fine. Okay. But I'm, I, I, I just don't want to say, because it's only a couple of feet, okay. we're not I hear in, you, you know. Yep. And so that's, well, and then the other one is, I have to give them credit for reducing the number of units down to I agree. four. Yeah. And I personally don't find that building uh, a blight to the neighborhood. I think it's it increases the value of the neighborhood. It, it, it falls in the character of the neighborhood. It's, it's a nice building. It is, it, a, it is a nice building. If it, was a, if it was a building that was like really obnoxious and, and, and anything else like that, I would, I would say, okay, it's in, within our preview to say, make it better. We're giving you some relief, make it better. But that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to reward people who make it better and give us, and they, and they made the reduction from six to four, so that if there's other buildings along that street that are six units or eight units, that they say, oh, well, if we just make it better, we, we, uh, uh, they're going to say, they'll give us some relief where they ask for it. That's what I'm trying to set up, okay? I just want to mention, I'll one, change one, the one more, and then, and then yeah, I'd like one. to go to Melissa. This has to do with the fence and front. Yes. So the EDR standards, are pretty specific about that. All open space, landscape, and usable shall be designed as to add to the visual amenities of the vicinity by maximizing its visibility for persons passing the site or overlooking it from nearby properties. So you can't have a fence that basically doesn't allow passers-by to look at the open space. So that's one of the EDR standards. So they're going to have to have some sort of fence there that meets that criteria. Thank you. Agreed. And I believe that fence was not uh, requested by any of us on the board at that meeting. Right. No, it, it wasn't. It came out of discussions with one of the, uh, the neighbors and they addressed it. And I, and I yeah. applaud you for that. Yeah. Talk, uh, listen to your neighbors. But it was not a request on our part. I'm done. Okay. done. We're good? <laughs> what was that? Um, <laughs> What's the question again? <laughs> we're, uh, we're, we're getting to what are these stipulations? Um, should we should we get to a vote this evening or to an ask for them to return? What what are the items that um, that we would either add to a decision or that we would like to to understand more of? Um, well, I guess in terms of the dimensions, I guess we do the final revised numbers that we're all comfortable with from the applicant that can be then verified by our building inspector, correct? I mean, that seems pretty straightforward to me. We need the previous ones, the, the FAR based on how it's calculated, the open space, and then we need to just double check that, what they provide by our building inspector, is that correct? I think what I, 
agreed with, so Steve identified that from confirming the um, open space calculations with the applicant, he felt comfortable with the way that those had been calculated and he explained how they typically review right, that in the ZBA. That. I feel comfortable with that too, but if that's something you felt that you need needed, we could potentially ask for that. Um, so that, that could be something if, if you felt that they needed to return with additional. I guess what I'm struggling with is just what I need versus what we need, Kelly, as to be, you know, kind of on the same, like the benchmark of what we all agree to. Less me, less, you know, Steve Rebelek. I think um, that's what I'm trying to get to. So I don't know how to best communicate that, but I would expect, you know, the applicant to provide the baseline that has been verified. You've provided that, I mean, in the updated documents. Um, and then maybe if we have, you know, some kind of confirmation from our building inspector that those are accurate, that would make me feel comfortable. Okay. Um, with regard to the parking, I have to, I think, um, I understand what you're saying, Ken. I actually, I would kind of be inclined to that proposal as a concept. Um, the reduction to four parking spaces if they include the parking <coughs> buffer. Right, or some reduction in that I would give the, I would probably allow some flexibility on the developer's part um, with the parking reduction. I mean, if there is, does it, Ken, I don't know, does it, in your opinion, do you feel like it has to go down to four or there could be one with a flexible space or something like that? So that maybe there's, you know, I'd easier be, I'm tandem. Flexible, I'm flexible. So, so I guess the idea is to reduce the parking space to allow for more open space and, you know, pervious surface. Um, and I think that's the goal there with trying to reduce some of the parking. So I could see it, me being amenable to that. Um, and I mean, I think that's where I stand. I think I kind of feel along your lines that if, you know, this abuts the bike path, you know, we are, we are in a position based on my understanding from town council to, um, provide some, you know, kind of come in some room for understanding on this project and depending on how you see you know housing I, I hear the people who came up to the microphone obviously you know six units versus four units home owner, owner occupied versus renter that we can continue to have those conversations you know what is best what's providing housing options but currently as the owner stands with the proposal before us um, and the investment, um, I'm inclined to, you know, kind of move it forward with outlining what I've said, um, leaning on what Ken said about the parking. Okay. Thank you, Melissa. Steve, your thoughts. I agree with Mr. Lau and Ms. Tentacolis in the sense that um, I would be willing to make a, you know, degree to sort of make a finding under 6111E with respect to the, uh, the buffering requirement if the applicant were to reduce the number of spaces. Um, you know, I would kind of prefer four, but, you know, six would also be okay. Um, I'm willing to leave that at their discretion. In terms of the open space, I'm comfortable that they, you know, meet the requirements for landscape and have reduced the nonconformity for usable with regard to the current plan submittal. Um, the one of, and with respect to the third floor, I would also uh, like, I would like to see a condition on the permit um, that the building inspector verify or um, affirm or verify, confirm that uh, the third floor does meet the building code. Um, you know, as, as Mr. Benson said, that's you know their area of enforcement, and you know I, I think a condition would just raise this as an area to check out. The one area where I'm having a little bit of difficulty or struggling with is the FAR increase. And I mean, because they've extended the building, there is an, an FAR increase. And, you know, this is sort of why I, you know, fussed over the word um, permitted, 
at our, our last hearing. You know, it's not clear, it's not really obvious to me where if that point three five, you know, the, the applying to any other permitted structure is intended to, was intended to apply to new construction and grandfather in pre-existing nonconformities or if it was intended to apply to all construction. Um, you know, and, and the, the way we handle usable open space nonconformity is just, you know, I, I think muddy, you know, puts a big question mark over that for me. So I guess, you know, I would, you know, I mean, if we're going to ask the applicant to come back, um, I would hope that they would consider a parking reduction. Um, and possibly, you know, to see if it's even possible to come up with a conforming amount of usable open space. Um, but I'd also like to have, you know, you know, to get some feedback from my other board members about how to interpret that FAR regulation. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> so where I am coming to with this is that I would like to get to a point where we could approve the reduction in parking um, to four to six spaces where I, it sounds like we're coalescing around that to include the parking buffer, add the condition for the building inspector to confirm the height of the building and the usability of the area in the half story, in the non seven, in the below seven foot um, half story section of the building add a condition regarding the fencing in the front and to um, require that for any increase to the FAR that they go to the CBA for a variance relative to 8.1.4 <coughs> personally. Can I add one more thing? Yes. yes. Uh, to waiver and to say if we were to postpone this for another hearing, okay, it's going to be in another two months because we don't meet. In August. In August. It would be in September. Okay. Uh, Bob? Yeah. Wait. It's our public schedule. Oh. I think we are generally all hung up on the FAR. Yes. In one point or the other, varying schemes, okay? And I can, I appreciate that. If we told them that the family room slash flex room, okay, is not an occupied space unless they get a variance from the um, um, zoning board. What, what uh, plan? Yeah, look on? in the basement. In the basement? Yeah, there's like 220 feet uh, in each unit, which is a flex room, family room. Thank you. Okay. One second. I'm trying to propose something here. I, that I makes appreciate it. that. I'm just trying to find it on the yeah. plan. No, no, I'm just trying to explain Thank to Bob. You. He's already. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but if we say that is not an occupied space, it's going to be storage space because you have no basement storage in this project here, okay? Which is fine. But we dedicate that as basement storage, it's a non occupied space. You get your project moving and you go to the ZBA and get your variance to get increased FAR. Would the board be okay with that? Storage would still count as FAR. In the basement? Yes. Okay. That's what we were just talking about with regard to how they need to recalculate the. Um, okay, I'm just trying to mix. I understand. I understand. Um. I'm, and again, I'm trying to propose. Because <laughs> if we delay this thing here, then. This gentleman here, this project here, is going to sit for another two months of doing nothing. I understand, and but we can't. Too, and that's not our fault. But but cal we can't rely on the existing calculation because I completely agree with Gene that the way that that picture is showing it, there is no way that the FAR is what it, what he's claiming it is for okay. the original structure with the pitch of those roofs. There is there is no way that it's what it what it is in this revised plan with all of the large. Dormers that are added. I don't know how to uh, get that answer because it's gone. That space is gone. I mean, it, 
uh, if it's gone and they can prove it, then I would use what's in the property card. I would agree. The property card is not the be all and end all, and as other people said, there are some problems with the property card, but I would, I would default to the property card. You, you would use that amount, you'd use the amount in, you'd get rid of the garage because they can't count that toward the FAR, and then we'd line them up and see what the FAR okay. would well, be with those. I'm just trying to work something I, out where I, all I, of us I understand. and where we can all meet somewhere in the middle. And, and by the way, I'm okay with the open space because I think in for both the usable and the landscape, they're going to have more than they did before. So, you know. So the only hang up right now is the FAR? Point. Yes. Okay. And plus the other things we're in mostly agreement on. Okay. In that's that's a good thing. We're down to one thing. Yes. All right. Can, well, can can you so we're in terms of the FAR? Can I, I understand and appreciate your proposal for that basement space? <clears throat> where where are we right now with the FAR? So I'm. That's the problem is that we no, don't no. we don't have no one knows we don't have a if we could ask them. Well, I, I, it's it's. I think we don't have a reliable calculation for the existing. Yes. Well, because the, the property problem. card seems inaccurate. The property card could, it's could be accurate, inaccurate, could be. but what seems inaccurate is what's in this latest table that we received. Yes, and table. I don't disagree with you. And remind me how the garage plays into it, Dean. They counted the garage count toward the gross floor area for the previous one, but under the rules you can't count it. So that has to be deducted from the gross floor area of the previous one. Madam Chair? Yes, Steve. So with regard to the FAR and the variance, um, just, I'd just like to point out that you know, variance conditions are set through the are set through state law. There are four of them, and one of them is that you know the CDA would need to make a finding that a literal enforcement of the zoning bylaw would result in a hardship owing to conditions of soil, shape, or topography that are present in the property for which the variance is being sought, but are not present in the district, the zoning district as a whole. It's a, it's a very high standard to meet. Um, and, you know, just my, I would be hard pressed if I were in the applicant's shoes. I, I would feel that I would be hard pressed to make that argument in a convincing way to the ZBA. So I think rather than if, if our proposal or if our current thinking is, well, then they should go to seek a variant from the ZBA, I, I think we should, you know, be a, we're, what I think we're effectively asking them, telling them to do is, we need you to reduce the floor area. <laughs> um, and, and, maybe, and maybe that we should just cut to the chase on that. Okay. Yes. yes. Oh, sorry, let's move the microphone back yeah. over to you. Uh, I was not here at the first hearing, unfortunately. Uh, but we're beginning to feel like a tennis ball. I filed with the zoning board way back, did a memo, uh, made the application with the zoning board, and it was sent back, and I was told they did not have jurisdiction. We have now filed with the ARB. Now we're losing sight of one issue here. And the one issue is the building is built, okay? Through no fault of Mr. Manley. The building got built because he got a permit from the building department. So before, first of all, I'd like you to lower your voice when you speak to me. Yep. Second of all, Building something that is not in conformance with state code yeah. or with the zoning right. code is the fault of your design professional. Yeah. When you build something, no matter when it is found to be not in compliance during after plan review, during construction, whenever it is, even if it's the day before your final yeah. seal, Which is I, excuse me, I'm still talking to you. Yeah. Even when it's during your walkthrough of your final CFO, yeah. you are required to bring that back into compliance. But so again, that is not an argument that I would like to go down 
during this hearing. Well, but I think it's important for the equities, for the members of the board and Jean Benson to know that the building is up. We so understand if that. The FAR, we understand that. If the FAR is going to be reduced, okay, then something substantial is going to have to happen to that building. And guess who's going to pay for that? Mr. Manny. I completely understand. And again, yeah. that, that, is, that does not preclude, that does not preclude the design professional or, or the, um, the owner from complying with the law, with the state laws. No. And, and okay. but he, doesn't have, he does not have a remedy. I understand, okay. and it's unfortunate, but yeah. it does not preclude them from complying with state and local jurisdictional and, laws. And, uh, listen to, to Mr. Revelick, who is well versed in ZBA matters. I've tried many cases before the zoning board. I would never take this case before the zoning board to seek a variance for FAR. I would never be able to satisfy the hardship requirement. Now, the difference with the ARB is you don't have to look at hardship. <coughs> that's not one of your, that's not one of your burdens, okay? Looking at hardship as the ZBA has to under Chapter 40A. So my suggestion is, and we were told, by the way, I was told the matter should be before the ARB. Kelly's memo to the board basically directs everything to the ARB. The section that is cited is 8.1.12b, uh, uh, and that talks about the fact that if a non-conforming use is changed from one use to another, then the board does have jurisdiction to, in fact, grant relief. Now, here we have, here we have, we had six units, not four. We understand the facts of the case. So if that is the case, then I think Jean and I are probably in the same boat in terms of wanting to understand what the existing FAR is, and we're going to need to get closer to the existing FAR. So if, if that is, is where we are, then I think that what I would like to propose is that the applicant return with a accurate application indicating the existing FAR and how they propose to bring the building closer in compliance to the existing FAR. Jean, do you have other thoughts? No, I think that's right. I, I mean, I agree with Steve and I agree with um, Mr. Anessi that the chance of getting a variance is probably zero or as close to zero <clears throat> as it could be. But um, yes, I think they need to come back and with a real FAR for the old building and show how they and show what they will do to meet that FAR with the new building. That's can I make a that's suggestion, I, Rachel? Please can. Um, can I request that we hold a special meeting? Um, in August, in our month off, just to hear this so that we can move them along? Uh, we would have to find a, a date that, that works for that and add that to the schedule. I would um, agree to find would you be a, a, I'd be amenable to, to trying to find one. I will say that the only dates that would to give them more than a week. Can I ask them a question? The only, the only date that would work for me is the 8th. Can I ask them a question? Yes. Would, you, would the 8th work for you guys to get all your FAR and all the, the questions we have together in that time frame? Or do you believe you need more time to sort of, I mean, it, like Bob said, the building is built. You, you can take numbers and measurements or whatever and, and say, hey, this is what we have. If it's over, here's what we can cut back. Or, no, we, uh, we meet it. I don't know. I'm just asking you, you know, can that work? Sure, I'll, I'll respond to that. Again, Don Bornstein, uh, attorney for the applicant. Um, so we left the last hearing session with a 
basically a list of homework. You gave us a list of things, information you wanted, yes. information added to the plan, changes to the plan, some design changes and considerations. We thought coming into this meeting that we had actually answered those questions and done those things. And I think the only the two questions I'm hearing right now that would trigger a further meeting are you want you want to see you want to see a calculation of the pre-existing FAR. I think that's that's at the at the previous meeting mm -hmm. and again today mm -hmm. we still don't have an accurate calculation of the existing FAR and to in order to compare the recalculation that we received today of the new buildings proposed FAR, which sure. changed mm -hmm. from the last time we met yeah. the, the FAR calculation. So we're still wrestling with what was existing, what is proposed, and what's the delta between the two. No, no, and I see that. I see there's a lot of confusion on those numbers, but I think what you have in your record is that thing. So there were some, there were some problems with those FAR calculations that were noted during the course of our first hearing session. We were asked to correct those and submit plans that had those calculations correct. Correct. I think we've done that. You, What's you, been called into question. Incorrect. If I could complete what I'm saying. Sure. Um, the, um, I, I think what's been called into question is we have an assessor's card that has multiple errors in it. One of them may very well be the third floor, but we have, we have the architects prepared pre-existing FAR plan that shows all the different FAR uh, measurements that he's calculated that. So we have that information. We have questions about construction under seven feet high, and we've been presented with a seventh edition building code to, to base that on, but it's clearly a building inspector's determination. I'm just, I want to understand that if this, if this hearing is continued, like what do we need to bring to you? Because we thought we've already brought these things to you. We have our architect's plan. I understand there's a reference to the assessor's card and we're not sure they match. I don't know what we come back with you on the 8th other than we think the assessor's card's wrong. We've, Chris has been very polite tonight, but I think just the assessor's card's wrong. Your architect's calculations were incorrect because as Jean pointed out, they counted the garage as part of the FAR that is not part of the FAR. We also. No, I don't think that's correct. correct. I think that was in the you first. That, that was in the both. first iteration. That's no, not both, the revised both, both, iteration. Both, both it iterations. is in this iteration, but it's in the GFA, not the FAR. But the GFA. The GFA is used to, to calculate, calculate the, FAR. the FAR. Well, this, this, I guess, this is right. going to get in the weeds, but that is not how your code works. So your definition of of FAR is based on GFA. So if you follow the definitions of your code. FAR says it's GFA over lot area. You go to GFA and GFA says it's area within a story. The basement is not considered a story, so it's not included. But you have another section of your bylaw in section five, which says you do count those areas. And that's why you could count a garage as GFA, but not count a garage as FAR. So I think the way the, the architect has spelled it out on the table is actually consistent because you have these two competing portions. Just the way you have two competing portions of the test for extensions of nonconforming use, we'd have reference to 8.1.4 saying you can't make a nonconformity any worse. But you have 8.1.1, which says you can. And, not, it, and it doesn't limit it to, to one and two family in homes. In any case, your third floor, there is no way that that is, that that is calculated correctly in the existing use. Yes. I can understand on the dimensional um, forms where the accessory building was identified incorrectly. My fault. I apologize for that. On the architect's um, existing conditions, page A04, FIR is calculated without the accessory building. The third floor of that building, I heard the uh, Steve Roop, Steve steep roof pitch and a hipped roof. If you look, the outline of that diagram has a ton of space for eaves, which is roof, roof area. I mean, we sent an architect in to capture existing conditions. These are the, from context, um, and they're, they're brought into MF engineering and designs plans. We have them. I mean, I, I have an email directly from the architect that I could send. It's, I mean, the, these are the existing conditions. I can't imagine what else we could provide 
that would prove that this third story is accurate. Excuse me, this half story, third floor, is accurate. I mean, I can look back to when we originally purchased the building and see if I can find basement pictures and third floor pictures. I cannot guarantee that I have them and I cannot guarantee that they would satisfy you because that would be subjective. I believe that this is a second floor kitchen. I don't believe, Chris, that it's a third floor kitchen. These are existing conditions for my architect. I'm not an expert at you know, architecture or zoning codes or anything else. That's why we hire professionals to do it. We had two different architects on this. One did the existing conditions, one did the proposed conditions. Do we have some discrepancies in our half story? Yes, we do. We're working directly with Inspector Champa on that. But we are no way intending to violate anything regarding a half story, anything regarding um, you know, the, the zoning bylaws or anything else. Um, the, the assessor's card is inaccurate. It, I mean, it had 8824 as the lot size. We would love to, for that to be our lot size. It was 8824, it's actually 7824. I mean, we're representing things as honestly and, open and transparently as we can. Am I making mistakes? Is my team making mistakes? Yes, we are. And you know what? It's embarrassing and it's really stressful. Um, what I can tell you is that a lot of what I'm hearing is, um, is not going to be possible for us. I understand that our financial issues are not your problems and necessarily your purview. But we're in this position because we secured a permit and we built according to that. And, you know, the, the economics don't work. As much as I would love to say, no problem, let's just get rid of the parking. Arlington doesn't have overnight parking. We've got four bedroom units that we would have never built if we were going to have one parking space per unit. I mean, you know, we build single family alternatives. And, I mean, for, you know, set aside the fact that we, we're meeting, we feel like we're meeting a need, we're trying to meet a need. Um, we're doing our best to improve circumstances. And I really, I agree with Don in spirit that I, I, I know that I did my best to answer the questions of the ARB. And I felt that we had responded in a way that at least um, clarified the existing conditions and what we have now minus the, the garage, which I'm happy to, you know, be corrected on because if I make a mistake, then I'd rather it be out in the open and we deal with it. Um, the economics don't work to reduce the FIR on this building down to what it was. The, F the economics don't work with reducing parking areas because people won't buy a four bedroom townhouse with one parking. And if we reduce it down to three or two bedrooms, the economics don't work on that either. We're really in a jammed up space here. We've been turned down for a refinance on the building already. Another lender that'll be more expensive told us that let us know if you get the approval because that's going to play into our decision. I don't know if this goes on much longer, and I'm being sincere because I really don't know, if we have future hearings, if you'll be meeting with our lender who takes over the property or if you'll be meeting with us. We're trying to move forward and have some kind of accommodation with what we were also told by Doug Heim is the ARB's discretion with regard to this matter. And it's not like we got our hopes up, but we were encouraged by the fact that uh, Doug Heim had that opinion and by our meeting last time. Um, I understand some of the residents' concern as well, and it's not been straightforward. I personally feel like the Arlington bylaw is very challenging to read. I'm a layperson at this point, um, but I've heard a lot of debate between the interpretation of it and I can only imagine what some of the residents think and, and thinking about what we did and how maybe we tried to manipulate the system some way. We try to maximize our developments because these days you have to pay all the money to buy something in Arlington and then we have to pay all the money to develop it because of materials and labor costs. We have to hope and pray that we, we find somebody who wants to pay all the money to buy it. The, pure eco the economics purely don't work for what I, what I'm hearing. And I understand. I feel like I'm just praying I, I for another solution. I understand solution. you're in a difficult position. Um, we're in a difficult position as well with being able to review this relative to what is allowable under our, our zoning bylaws. Um, Gene, your thoughts on the 
recalculation of the FAR? Well, I don't know what to do because if they don't have any other numbers because they've already right. redone They're just gonna be part of the building, then I don't know what to do. I, I don't think the attic number is correct, as I stated before, because if there's only way they can fit those in with that roof line yes. is if they were lower than seven feet. And if they're telling me that that doesn't count toward GFA for their attic, then it shouldn't count for GFA for the attic in the previous building. So I don't want to mix apples and oranges. It's either all apples or all oranges. So I don't know what to do with the gross floor area um, for, the, for the attic. I don't know what to do with the gross floor area for the basement. Because they're counting, are you counting the whole basement of the previous building? Um, what I did without having, uh Somebody mentioned it, I believe it was um, Stephen. He mentioned something about mechanicals being spread around and not being able to determine exactly what was being used for mechanicals. That's very much how the existing basement was. You'd have a couple water heaters over here, a couple water heaters over here, gas meters over here. Um, we have dedicated mechanical space, but what I didn't try to do, I'm, <laughs> I'm not trying to fudge the numbers and say we don't have me mechanical space in the basement, but we do in the attic. I I left them clear. So I left the basement clear. Um, you'll see the calculation on page A04. Oh, excuse me, no. A03, he shows a wide open yes. basement. And relatively, we calculated the, uh, the proposed basement the exact same way. And in the attic, we have mechanical areas. Um, and I'm they may be in the area below seven feet, so we're not calculating them. So I'm not saying we're giving them away or anything like that, um, but we've, we're doing our best to be as accurate as we can on the plans. And um, I also feel like, on, with all due respect on the parking um, setback, I feel like we meet the exception for that. I feel like we've done everything we possibly can reasonably, and I feel like we secured the, um, created even the um, landscaped open space on the lot and that will dramatically impact us as much as I really appreciate the the creativity and the solutions I just I don't know it's really it's really challenging to look at any any one solution and and uh, and feel like it's going to work for us because it's the buildings already built and I, I understand I, and I'm sorry I need to keep moving this long we still me. have another Kelly it looked like you were gonna say no something. it was just a clarification that even though the uh, garage is included on the worksheet. It's not actually a double check the calculations from um, sheet A04 and the calculation of FAR. What may be incorrect here is that the calculation of the attic, like how much that contributes to the pre existing FAR, but the overall, like the garage was not included oh. in that 0.92. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thanks. All right. Madam Chair? Yes, Steve. Yeah, yeah again, again, regardless, or regardless of, you know, qu questions or ambiguity in the FAR calculations, what, I, what I've been hear, sort of hearing the conversation go is that, you know, we as a board are um, uncomfortable with the increase in FAR. So they've added, the applicant has added five, has extended the building by five feet in the front and five feet in the back. So there's no way they can do that without, <laughs> I, there's, there's, you know, if they, if they, having done adding 10 foot to the overall length of the building, they've, they've increased the FAR. And if we're telling them that, you know, if our position is that we want you to be closer to the original FAR, regardless of, you know, ambiguity or not, we're, we're really telling them we'd like you to take 10 feet off the building. And if that's correct, um, you know, we should, I, I, I hope that we could, say that directly, or um, ask the applicants if they would prefer to have us vote tonight. Because I'm not really, what I, I realize that, you know, there, we'd like to be clear, you know, we want the numbers to ensure, we want to ensure that we have accurate numbers, but if the applicants double check, they come back to us and, you know, the FAR is still point zero point nine. You no, know, just say it goes from instead of 0.92 to 0.99, it goes from 0.92 to 0.98. 
when that happens, are we going to tell to you know want to tell them we you need to make the, the FAR smaller? Um, I'd rather save them the hassle of you know coming before us again and just you know be really clear about what we you know what we want. Thank you. That's fair. What are Madam Chair? What, what, I'd just like to can I just finish yeah, the yeah. conversation with Steve? Um, so, what are your feelings on that, Steve? Um, you know, again, this is um, this is this is this is a difficult one. You know, and there I have. I'm torn. On one on one hand, you, know, you say that you can say that the if you were to say that the 0.35 FAR limit is applicable to this building, and we're asking them from an FAR for an FAR reduction, then you know I think we have to tell them you need to go back and make the building smaller, take off the addition. On the other hand, if we think the FAR regulation is not applicable to this pre-existing non-conforming structure. But I would be okay with the FARs that they have submitted. Thank you. Steve. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to, I guess, say to Steve, um, I agree with your thinking and how you're proposing, you know, how you're laying it out, because I think um, thinking through what the next steps would be coming back with a recalculation is very important for us to think about what what is that request with even the the change in some small which I would almost deem kind of de minimis in my opinion but um, so you know you, Steve you had said something like where everyone's falling you know having and taking issues with the FAR I just wanted to say that that's not where my you know my concern was um, so I was comfortable where the applicant was with you know kind of the FAR on this and comfortable with the ARB having some ability to waive that under these conditions and I say I also agree with Melissa for that's how I stayed the first time around. Uh, I believe that we're all in alignment, though, on the parking space reductions. Yes. I, well, the, I think we're in agreement to have some more, have the buffer zone. I, I'm not willing to give relief on the buffer zone. But every, everything else I am, I'm okay with. I would have you guys take a look at it again and see if you can uh, keep the, if you, if you guys feel strongly that you have to get the eight parking spaces, then you have to tell me exactly what the square size of the open space is that you got there. You guys don't have any dimensions there at all. And so if you can tell me you can work with that a little bit, I'll work with you on a little bit on the open space. Uh, but. But I think you cannot, I, I don't want to start down the road where you can just butt up against a neighbor's property and put your parking car there. That's, that's I feel strongly about that. Everything else I'm, I'm fine with. Can you say that again, please? Not having a buffer zone uh, against a property line. Okay? Your car, you're parking your car is right against your property line. Okay? And I prefer if you had a buffer zone there. And if you want to give some, if you want, if you're asking for some relief, maybe we'll give you some relief on the open space, but not, not on, um, not on the uh, requirement of the leading buffer zone. Okay. I understand. Sorry. That's no, no problem. That's my feeling, and I'm not sure what you guys are, but that's, you know, I, if, it sounds like Steve's correct. We should. I mean, I think. Extending things out for better or worse is not going to help them at all Agreed. or whatever. And I don't know what they can say any more to us to um, change our feelings. Um, so we could craft a, a motion this evening. Um, I just don't know where the vote is going to go on the FAR. Gene, do you have any 
thoughts on is there well, anything it, yes so here here's the strict way of looking at this I would make a motion to reject the special permit because the even if we take their numbers which we doubt the <laughs> FAR that they're proposing is higher than the FAR in the old building. So we technically don't need to know right. what the FAR was just to say they're, they're making the nonconformity greater. And for those of us who believe that they should not be able to make the nonconformity greater, we would vote when we're going to deny the permit. Then that will only get two votes. So then one of the other people will vote to make a motion to grant the permit. You and I will vote no, and the motion to grant the permit will fail. So again, my, my challenge here is that if to Melissa's point, um, there was a way to, to prove the delta really is a minimal increase in the FAR as they are attempting to show in this revised calculation here, which again, I do not believe is accurate. I would feel one way. Because I don't feel that this is accurate, I have a hard time supporting the proposed increase in FAR And I, I don't know how to ask them <laughs> to put back in that the building isn't there anymore. Well, I'm simply stating that, like Jean said, it's not asking to prove it. But us as on the board say, uh, incremental um, difference is minor. As it's shown, but again, I don't believe that this but is you, accurate. But let's say if it's twice the full, still fairly minor. Okay, so you're just, your issue is that it's wrong. It's wrong. Okay, and I'm trying to say, can we overthink that right. and say, even though the thing is wrong, we're approving <coughs> this because, well, I'll go back to my original statement, that's all I'll, I'll say there, okay, I don't want to. Yeah, I, mean, I understand. You, you have your feelings and, yep. I, and I respect it, okay, I'm not right. going to. Um, what, what I'd like to try and do is get to a place where we do not need to, rejecting the special permit does these folks no good. We have to get to something that we can approve that works for them because the building is, is up. It's, it's built, right? So we need to offer some sort of suggestion for a modification that would be acceptable to the board so that they can continue moving forward. So if, if we credit their attic number is correct, right. if we go yes. there, they and subtract the garage, then the gross floor area of the old building was 7,205. I got rid of the decimals. Yeah. 7,205 square feet. The gross floor area of the new building is 7,798 square feet. So they would have to reduce they would have to reduce the gross floor area of their building by 593 square feet if we credit their numbers as correct. And I agree with Melissa saying that. For 593 square feet. Is this worth right. causing such hardship? That's where I'm at right now, okay? Right. That's where I'm at. Steve, where are you with that right now? If we agree that 593 square feet is the delta. Uh, I, would be, I, would be, I would be comfortable saying that the delta is 593 square feet. I would also be comfortable reading the 
FAR requirement in the bylaw is not applying to pre-existing non-conforming structures. Um, now, I guess if, you know, so the question is, is, you know, do we ask the applicant to remove 593 square feet, or do we think that the requirement is not applicable in this case? I, to me, that's the question. And do you stand on that question? I think it's not applicable. Okay. Um, so I could also, if it's 593 square feet. Can I make a request? Yes, please. Kelly, do you happen to have the table that you provided in the original memorandum? Um, we yes. talked. We talked. We did some. We had some discussion about massing of properties mm -hmm. and gross yeah. building area to lot size. <clears throat> and our building fits the neighborhood. It fits right in the Beautiful. median. Yeah. Um, the proposed. That's, not, that's the, not what we're talking about, though. Yeah. Right. Uh, we, we're in agreement that your building fits. Right. I, I'm just referring to general massing and the fact that it's not detrimental. I realize that the technical calculation is FAR. I just. I. I, 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 I think the building is over. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. I no. just wanted to point out the, the table that Kelly um, had submitted. The 18 to 20 Belknap proposed is at 1.04 gross area to land area. It's right in the me it's it's actually right at the median. The median is 1.035 in that neighborhood, and that's the proposed. That's the gross area. That's not even the GFA or the FAR. That's the gross building itself, and it fits perfectly in the middle of all of those other buildings and a lot of those most of those are two families so the two family massings are huge and I realize the regulations are different for two families but just in terms of it being not more detrimental to the neighborhood I, I not detrimental to the neighborhood is not our standard because we're not using that standard because that's not the right standard under the zoning bylaw that's the right standard if you were a one or two family house but that's not the right standard for anything other than a one or two family house. So that's not the standard to use. The other thing I'll point out is, you know, the whole point of zoning is to, you know, allow non-conforming uses to continue as long as they don't change their use, but not to make them more extreme. Not, you know, every time we allow a non-conforming use to get greater, then the next person comes in and the non-conforming use gets greater again and greater again and greater again. So, you know, my, my feeling is that we have an obligation and the obligation is to apply the bylaw and the bylaw as I read it says the FAR of the new building or the reconstructed building should not be any greater than the FAR of the building before. And that's just where I am. Oh. Now, if I could just jump in for one Please. second, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to note that we don't necessarily agree with that, that the non-conforming use test doesn't apply here, the not substantially more detrimental. That, that was noted in my original letter. I just want to make sure that's on the record. But I think we do have, we might not have agreement, but we might have consensus. And people might get there in different ways. And everyone, every board member can have their own way of reaching the end goal um, and still um, have a consensus on the, on the decision. So we're hearing some folks that are saying, you know what, I think that FAR applies, but you know what, 570 odd square feet on a, you know, on a much larger building than that is de minimis and we can, we can let that ride. Um, and I'm also hearing that, um, that at least one member doesn't think FAR applies, which was where I started on this wing when Chris first approached me, um, because a non-conforming uh, non use or non-conforming structure is not a permitted structure. It's, it's non-conforming. It's specifically not permitted. Um, and, and I think um, Member Benson's statement just now about how we should treat non-conformities and we're against those just adds weight to that, is that is not a permitted structure and it's other permitted structures that are subject to FAR at all. So I think between those combination of those two things, I think you potentially could reach a consensus of the board that gets us to an okay on the slight increase on FAR, 
Um, and then there are a lot of other conditions about design and, um, and layout that the, that the boards kicked around. So in terms of the massing, one of my biggest problems with this project is the, mass, the two massive dormers on, on either side. I could get to a place where I could improve the increase in the FAR. They are going to need to reframe those dormers in any case because of the pitch, which was originally 1 to 12. They've taken it down to 2 to 12. If we could get to a place where those were significantly reduced in size, whether in depth or the pitch came down even further, to me that is what throws this entire building out of scale. And I could get to the increase in FAR if we could relook at those dormers on either side that you already need to reframe. Yes. Is that something you would be amenable to? Yes. Okay. Do we need to see that? I think we would need to see that. Give me, give me a minute to, yeah, to think uh, about uh, it. This is, uh, so you would propose taking this to a 3 to 12? I would need to see a significant reduction in those two dormers on either side. Again, whether it's in how, um, how deep they are in the building, how long they are, the pitch of the roof, they're completely over oversized. I'm not sure exactly uh, how possible it is to do what. I don't, I, the last thing I want to do is make any promises. I want to be conservative, but uh, what we did across the street was we, we dormered it more and it had a, had a different look to it. Um, I'm hoping that we could achieve something closer to that and make it not as, uh, as pronounced. I don't know exactly what we can do. There's a lot of structure there to, to rework, but we... I'm trying to get a place where I, I'm we're, not asking you to... He's open Totally to it, open right? to it. But I, I think I need to I understand. See, I, I, Do you see what I, I'm saying? I see your point here. And my suggestion to you is you have this hallway that goes down to the door that goes out to the, out to the deck. Mm -hmm. Okay? If you got rid of the hallway, that, sh that would shorten the, the dormer by I don't know, four feet on each side so that, she, so that the whole dormer would be eight feet smaller in length is that what you're talking about rachel and then you just move I'm that i'm sorry door. i'm trying to get to there on my oh, oh sorry <laughs> no not your fault uh top floor third floor yes okay see the see how that they have a hallway that leads right out right if they were to just bring that outside wall to the closet wall there and then do you have a have it up there is this up here, here. uh it's i'm oh, sorry i'm in the wrong i'm sorry Sheet A05. You talk about this hallway here. Yeah, if you would just take this hallway and bring it across and put the door swinging in this way here, and then that HVC is now in that slope roof area there. So all you did is get rid of this spot right here, and this thing here now is struck down about four feet on each side of the dormer. Now the dormer uh, is uh, less. So it's pulled back from the edge of the building. So, yes. So, so the notch you forgot to put a deck is bigger. Okay, so... Yeah, am, I, am I clear enough or no? Because no. we're going to agree to something, I want to make sure we're clear. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so this here would become a steeper pitch? No, it and pulls away. Okay. So this is the outside wall right here, right? Continuing outside wall in here. And then, see what this right here is the end of the dormer? Then the dormer right here. Okay. And then the door was just swaying out into the deck. And then this would be all deck. Okay, and you can see the figure out. You figure it out, I guess. They could take a chunk of the closet out, and that's a huge massive closet. All right. Okay. I 
ีเข้าไปกันพักสายพักกันแครสแตนด์ก็ that's a small reduction Oh, on all four corners. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yes, yes. That that I would yes that I would support. I'm I'm. Good compromise. Steve, are you following what we're suggesting here? <laughs> Steve. Sorry, I just let my mic go. It's okay. So uh, let me see. If I were. <laughs> So if uh, on the third floor, if in all four corners, um, you pull out where the HVAC closet and the hallway to the decks are, which effectively removes about four feet, so eight feet of the dormer on each side of the building. I think we've lost. Steve, are you there? I think we lost your audio again, Steve. No, we're still here. So, in other words, the front, the face of the building, would the roof line would have a continuous slope, and there would be a shed dormer a few feet back from the uh, from the uh, fascia board. Yeah. Are you okay? Hello. With that? I'm, I apologize. I'm not following. Uh. Well, no. What? what? I thought we were. Yeah, we're, we're talking the same thing. Okay. Yeah. What I explained to you, are you okay with that? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'm getting the affirmative from my team that we can, uh, we can do that. Yes. Yes. Is one of the so public allowed can, to make a suggestion? Can, are, are you on the project team? No. Uh, sorry. Thank you. Can, can, I, can I tell Steve why he's, I think he's incorrect? Sure. Steve, the reason I think you're incorrect by saying that it's not subject to the FAR is take a look at that. If it weren't subject to the FAR under your reading, which I think is incorrect, it wouldn't be subject to a maximum height. It wouldn't be subject to a maximum stories. It wouldn't have any landscape open space requirements. It wouldn't have any of those things. We're issuing the permit for this thing. It will be a permitted structure. I think you're wrong by saying that the FAR does not require it. Because if you were to say that, you'd be blowing up this whole part of the zoning bylaw. And it, and it does apply. And um, you might agree with my colleagues here that you're going to give them a pass on the FAR if they make the dormers a little less imposing, and I'm not going to agree with them, but I just want to make it clear that I think you're going in the wrong direction by saying that the FAR does not apply because all sorts of other things wouldn't apply to it, and that would really be a mistake. Oh, so Mr. Yes. If, if I could refine that, Mr. I in that case, yes, I, the your your example of height. Um, I think solidifies that for me because we use the same language any other permitted use there as well. So um, I will change my opinion to the FAR does apply, but I would be okay with a with a with a small increase. And the FAR would go down by say four by let's say that's six, uh, well twenty four. So it's about a hundred, hundred. Well, this is that's in the half story, so it yeah, actually wouldn't wouldn't affect that wouldn't affect the FAR. It, it just affect affects the, the mass. It affects right. the massing. So I'm all for two right now with the, with the basement and. The, <laughs> the, the creative tries though, Ken. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is this the most accurate rendering from the front still? 
yes. With the increase the in rear. No, that's yeah, the front. front. That's the front. Yeah, I mean, I'd argue like the overall massing is most effective because they enclose. I think with the change in the roof pitch marks, yeah. I'm going to have more area. Oh. Um, yeah. So it's going to be smaller anyway. Yeah. Okay. Oh no, that's accurate. Are you getting close? Bishop, can I call for both? We're getting yes. close here. Okay. So, so I think we do have consensus here on the applicant team that of a willingness to accept a condition that the floor plan for the uh, for the third level, the attic story of the uh, or the attic height of the building in four locations, one for each unit, would eliminate the HVAC. Um, we'll call it HVAC room or HVAC space in the adjoining um, hallway area. So there'd be four um, segments of the one in each unit that would be eliminated to reduce the massing of the uh, of the dormers. Yes. The other part of this proposed um, this proposed plan is stepping back the entire third floor on each end. So that's our goal. Um, we, we reserved our right to change third floor plans and elevations just in case, but the team's been working back and forth with trying to make the, um, the front of the building less pronounced. And I feel confident that we've achieved that with this design because it'll look a little different than this. Um, our goal is to step this section back so that it looks a little, like I said, a little less. Which, which is what's currently reflected in your rendering or beyond floor what's plans. Uh, it, it's currently reflected on the floor plans what we did on 1315 Belknap was we went straight up with this right which I do not yes and want to see it again the rendering shows this being straight up but the floor plans actually show the front of the building being stepped back on the third floor so that was our that was our our intention was to Set that back so that it was a little Which bit is more. where the reduction on the third floor is, Gene, that you had asked about previously. Correct? Wasn't there a question about? Where that was set back? No, I don't think I did. But that was the second floor you were asking about. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I can, I can get behind that. Do you want to make the? Uh, I, do you want to make a? I motion to approve this uh, project with the following consensus. Um, so we we're going to add a condition for the building inspector to confirm the height the height of the building to be below thirty five feet. Kelly, you're capturing yep. these? Okay. Yep. That the condition that the building inspector review the use of the area proposed in the half story um, area in the half story area of the building with a height below seven feet. Qualifies for four, a half story. Correct. He's going to certify that. Um, we're going to reduce the parking spaces to between uh, four and six to include a buffer, the required buffer zone, subject to administrative review and approval with the Department of Planning and Community Development. Uh, there will be a reduction in the four corners of the third floor to reduce the overall massing of the uh, of dormers. the third floor dormers, subject to review and approval by the Department of Planning and Community Development. So you'll need to resubmit those plans. Um, the uh, there's an added condition that the fencing in the front front of the property be no higher than three foot six, I believe you proposed, correct? Uh, and, um, and open, open 
Right, open, uh, with open slots. Um, did I miss any conditions? Steve, did you have any additional conditions? Um, I, think, I think that covered it. So nothing further for me, Madam Chair. Okay, Melissa, did we miss anything? Okay, Gene, did you have anything to add? Ken? So motioned. Uh, is there a second on docket 3704? Okay, we'll take a roll call vote. Ken? Yes. Jean? No. Steve? Yes. Steve? Yes. Melissa? Yes. I'm a yes as well. Congratulations, it's been approved. Um, Thank you. you will need to follow up with, the, with Kelly, the department, for the modifications we discussed this evening. Um, as well as uh, with revised plans to the building inspector. Thank you very much. Thank you for dealing with a very difficult situation. Yes, Appreciate thank you. It. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, uh, so that now closes uh, the public hearing for docket number 3704, 18 to 20 Belknap Street. Um, we will now move to the open space and recreation plan update, which is agenda item number three. Thank you very much for your patience this evening. I know that this is much later than we had originally scheduled the update. Thank you, for your time and your Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Even you, Mr. Benson. <laughs> I try to, you know. Thank you for all of you who came uh, this evening as well. Who's presenting this? Okay. Hi, Kelly. <laughs> uh, timing wise, I can't move them out of order. Just no. <laughs> Thank you very much for bearing with us. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, so yes. So um, thank you very much for um, joining us this evening. Um, I very much enjoyed reading the incredibly comprehensive uh, plan that was presented, and we'd love to take you through any highlights that you you um, you'd, you'd like to recognize. And um, you know, then I'd, I'd like to open it up uh, afterwards to the to the board for any uh, comments or questions that they might have. And my understanding is the request is for the board to um, uh, be able to vote to ad adopt the, the plan ultimately, correct? Yes, and provide a letter of support that we can submit with the application, Great. Um, the final application to the state. Great, thank We're not you very adopting much. It. We just ran a letter of, of support. Uh, we would vote to endorse the plan, which is what we did with the housing production plan, correct? That's the technical yes. verbiage? I also have um, a letter that was submitted from the, from the ARB as part of the 2015 to 2022 Open Space and Recreation Plan, so yes. perhaps you could vote to provide or give Rachel the authority they to review, to adjust, to, and yeah. sign the letter. Yes. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you very much. If you could introduce yourselves for record and um, again, take us through any any highlights of the plan that you, you'd like to. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Ann LaRoyer, the chair of the Open Space Committee. And I'm David Morgan, environmental planner for the town of Arlington, also the conservation agent. And our liaison to the planning department from for the Open Space Committee. Um, so thank you for having us here tonight, and thanks for changing the date from July 11th when I know you were originally going to do it so, um, when I, so I could be here. Um, most of you, I think, are new to this open space recreation plan process since the last one was approved in 2015, although I think Jean maybe was 
involved in one of the very first ones back in 1996. Is that yes, right? Yes, I'll tell the story when... Okay, well... We, we have more time. We'll get yes. <laughs> I'll, tell, I'll tell a very short version. Okay. <laughs> so you, you have some sense of the what's involved. Um, and I also wanted to thank Steve, who's, I guess, a, at home somewhere else. Um, he sent me a list of a lot of comments and questions, which were very helpful, and I have um, made note of those and incorporated some of the, the things that were able to be incorporated into the, the final, final draft. What you had was a, a nearly final draft, but we're, we're going to make, you know, there's a number of corrections and various things we have to continue to do. Um, I also wanted to thank David and Kelly, um, who um, have re really worked a lot with um, the committee on this, and of course, um, Jenny Reid and Emily Sullivan, who was the previous um, uh, environmental planner who worked with us when we started this in, in 2020. So as, you, as I think you know, the um, Open Space Committee also did receive um, funds from the Community Preservation Act Committee and was approved by town meeting. So we were able to hire Horsley Witten um, planning firm to help us with the entire process. Um, they did a lot of the work on the required demographic and environmental data um, using the state and federal resources, census data, all that kind of stuff. They led the uh, public participation process, which was very um, broadly based. And um, they have designed, did the final design and layout of the actual report, which will be printed. A small number will be printed, but it will be, of course, posted online and broken out into all the different sections the way the current one is now. So they've been, they've been really helpful. Um, Chris Demarovec was the person that we've been working with there. Um, so the same draft that you received, we sent at the end of June um, to the Division of Conservation Services, um, which is the, or the entity in the state that um, establishes the guidelines for open space plans and has to give the final state approval. So this, what you're doing is endorsing and adopting it for the town, but the state has to also approve it. Um, so we've already, actually quicker than I expected, received conditional approval. We had a letter from um, the state that it is conditionally approved, so there are some things we have to update and continue to provide, including the letters of support, which is a required part of this. <laughs> um, but they, um, they seem to think it was um, a good first draft, and there's just a, a few things that we'll work with Horsley Witten on to um, address their concerns, or just a few things that were missing. So um, as we worked on this process, we really, the main thing was to listen to residents and town staff and other committee members and the more than a thousand people that um, filled in the survey that we had put online um, back in 2021. And so that was one of, our, one of our main goals is to listen and see what needs people were expressing and then to turn those into the goals and objectives that are that are in the action plan so some of the um there were three themes that i just wanted to mention that um came out you know throughout all this process and that we tried to incorporate throughout the plan and the, all the various sections of it and those are um, sustainability accessibility and collaboration just as three terms <laughs> to think about um, so sustainability, of course, addresses mostly natural resource concerns, climate impacts and vulnerability uh, preparedness, nature-based and green infrastructure kinds of planning and development, um, management of water bodies, public street trees, native plants, pollinator pathways, invasive plants, all these kinds of primarily environmental concerns that have to do with our open spaces. Um, accessibility relates to both um, social access through um, special attention to diversity, inclusion, and equity issues, as well as physical access, um, both for the disability community and for all residents, um, through things like safe um, pedestrian and bike routes, um, ADA walkways, signage, translation services, public and just public information in general to make the open spaces more well-known and accessible. And then collaboration um, highlights the ongoing need to work closely with the town, um, town staff, and the other boards that we work with, um, 
Park and Recreation Commission and Conservation Commission, especially DPW and, of course, the Planning Department, um, and all of the other plans and initiatives that the town is working on in terms of the bikeway, in terms of transport, other transportation issues, um, housing, where it applies, um, and also to work with local businesses. Um, and then a little broader uh, range is the state and regional entities that we also work with already and, and continue to work with on um, things that go beyond our borders. And an example of that right now is around Alewife Brook is one of the things that a lot of people are that we're working on and concerned about. So those are three kind of the overall themes. But um, other things that are kind of constant concerns that have come up in probably all of our plans, past plans, um, have to do with maintenance of parks and um, playing fields and other kinds of open spaces. Maintenance is always a big concern. Um, there are a lot of challenges that come up from time to time about conflicting priorities and uses of our limited open spaces. Um, staffing and funding needs are, of course, another constant that um, need to be addressed and so that we can all continue to, to make, every, make things better and address the needs that the community has. Um, another constant theme or um, concern is public education and awareness. Again, like I said, just making, making um, not information about our open spaces and recreation facilities available to people and well known to them through social media and other ways of communicating um, and helping people understand the importance of, of their own work on their own properties in terms of doing um, sustainable kinds of landscaping and work and just trying to educate people about open space in general. And finally, acquisition is um, of more open space. People always want more. We always would like to have more, but um, we all know that Arlington's pretty much built out and there aren't that many opportunities, but um, we also want to try to think and we addressed some ideas about trying to think and work creatively about non-traditional open spaces and try to think more, since we are limited in what we can do with new open spaces, to try to find new infill opportunities. There, um, like Broadway Plaza is an, an example. The restaurant um, parklets are an example. There probably are other things that as new developments come, come around to think about how to create open space in a sense of um, and just just to you know try to try to help address streetscapes and the ways people experience the community um, of course the elephant in the room I'm, I can't not mention is the Mugar property <laughs> um, because that's such a complicated situation it's been difficult to try to figure out how to talk about that um, but I'm happy for any um, suggestions and we we also did talk with the select board about this as well um, and so that's um, that's that's where we are acquisition is you know is not gonna is gonna be a difficult process but there's lots of things we can do creatively I think and we've tried to outline some of those things to um, to address these other themes and needs that we have so I'll, I'll leave it there and David can, or Kelly can say anything they want <laughs> So the conditional acceptance letter I have in front of me from the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, it refers to this plan as particularly thorough, and I just want to underscore how different it is from other municipalities. We got some feedback from Horsley Witten, who had done some comparisons with other municipalities' plans, and those were cursory at best. You know, these are rubber stamp kind of submit to fulfill the letter of the law and not meet the spirit and the open space committee has gone above and beyond to provide us with a very comprehensive plan as the environmental planner i can't say how valuable that is to me i mean we often joke in the department that all the other planners sort of have a, a checklist you know there's a plan with a set number of action items that they can accomplish and they know what their agenda is I think that the open space and recreation plan serves 
in large part to be my checklist. And this version connects with all of the existing plans. It builds on the shoulders of the transportation plans, the uh, hazard mitigation, also touches on ongoing work, like our public land management plan, our MS4 requirements under the stormwater uh, requirements of the uh, engineering division and how we work together interdepartmentally. Um, so I, I will really just leave it at that. I think it's a very forward-looking plan, very significant to my work, and I could not be more grateful for Anne's efforts and the Open Space Committee. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'd love to open it up to board members for any questions, um, comments that you might have. Um, and Ken, we'll start with you. I'm not sure um, is it you guys are, are was spearheading this with the uh, DEP. It was um, creating um, sort of uh, a, a, a water, uh, a stormwater recharge, these dog ears on the streets. And we did a couple of pilot ones. Um, the rain gardens? Yes. We're right at the end of the streets. Yes. And where you would have the uh, rainwater go into these little dog ears and we recharge the groundwater in the neighborhood. And unless it overflowed and there's a sewer drain there that then it goes back in there. Was that part of your uh, uh, pre preview? I, I, it's been such a long time since we talked about this. Two, two years ago, I think, there was a presentation about a pilot program, I think, in East Arlington. Yeah. And I, yeah. I thought that was something really unique. But then I'm not, I've seen it in two or three cases, and I said, wow, that's good. It's working. But that's it. <laughs> uh, um, were you guys doing that? Well, maybe I can, um, should have explained that the Open Space Plan and the Open Space Committee is, um, is a, as a policy document. We, we're not, we don't own any land. We don't manage any land. We don't build rain gardens. <laughs> um, but, we, but we do address those, those goals in the plan. They are listed in the plan, and that's, that's actually one of the important sort of green infrastructure kinds of things that, that I talked about. Um, that would be the DPW. Um, I think in that case, the, the Mystic River Watershed Association was also involved in some of the planning for that, probably the Conservation Commission. Um, so, so that's why collaboration is such an important part of this whole process, because this is a plan that kind of lays out goals and ideas, but other organizations and other entities have to implement them. Yeah, well, so and something could that be something like mentioned in your plan? That it is. Yes, it, it is, is mentioned, mentioned those, quite a quite a few times. Dog year rain gardens. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. One of the goals is to increase the biodiversity of those rain gardens, and uh, while we were in process of updating the plan, I started having a conversation <coughs> with the engineering division about how we go about that, and so. It's an ongoing conversation. Um, okay. Yeah, it's it's just kept alive by. Especially this week, since it was so hot. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, the asphalt, the concrete, it was just like an island of just heat. It just was, you know, well, ha having those little patches. To break it. As small as it, it may be, it, I think it's so nice. That, I mean, again, that's, that's um, you know, this idea about trying to think about non traditional open spaces. I mean, those are very tiny. But they're important for both for stormwater, as you said, and for pollinator plantings, native plantings, and just just improving the the neighborhood. You know, reducing some of the large street intersections and creating more rain garden corners or whatever you call them. Um, you know, those are th those are listed as goals here, um, or as objectives, I should say. Um, not in not in the specific sites or locations, but I mean that's something that I think the town wants to think about doing whenever opportunities arise to be able to do that. Funding, of course, is you know becomes the problem, but but I that's that's something that a lot fund. of neighborhoods would like to see. <laughs> I think a lot of people in neighborhoods would like to see. Thank you. Anything else? No, I think this is a really nice uh, report. Great. Enjoy Thank reading you. it. Yeah, it was a really nice job. I have to admit I didn't get to read the whole thing in detail because I was trying to figure out what to do with that 
you know, 18 yeah. to 20 <laughs> Belknap Street, which took up an incredible amount of my time, but I did, you know, skim it the best that I could. It looked really um, terrific. And as Anne said, I have like a special place in my heart for the open space and recreation plans, because in the early 1990s, the town didn't have one, and you don't get opportunities to apply for some state grants, mm. which I think is still true if you don't have them. So I was chairing the environment task group of what was then called Vision 2020. And I said, let's pull together some people and get the plan written. And the town gave us a little money to hire somebody to do it. And one of the things that came out of that was, let's create an open space committee so we never again fall into the situation of nobody doing it and somebody can do it and monitor it. So, yeah. So I do have a few questions. Sure. And some of, and some of them have to do with what you're talking about, about um, competing priorities. And I can't figure out whether they were in this and what to do about them if you were. So, for example, there's a proposal now to put a dirt bike track at Hills Hill. Mountain biking, How does, yeah. Right? Where was it? Hills Hill, right? Mountain biking. They Mountain call biking. It. Well, dirt bike. Is, um, does this say anything about how that decision gets made or not? Mm. No, not. I wouldn't say that it, it addresses that per se. It, it, um, one of the problems is mountain biking has become a popular new um, activity. Not Just so like, new anymore, right? Not so new, maybe, but new for Arlington. <laughs> so I, the Park and Recreation Commission is the entity that is right. kind of in charge of that. Well, both they, they're in charge of Hills Hill, which is the area that's been designated as the place to, to do a feasibility study. Well, they did the feasibility study, but now they're trying to continue, you know, how is that gonna be developed further? Um, I think that the there is a hearing already scheduled on April, I mean, uh, August 2nd, I think. And I, I think that there will be a lot of conflicting opinions about how, how or if that should be done. Yeah, the, um, yeah I mean, Laura, and I think, I don't know how you, do that, but the plan, I think, is an opportunity, if it can be done, to say how the town well, this, should it, it, weigh it's... the open space recreation pieces. I'll just leave that as a yeah. thing to think about. We're, we're going to, at our, we have a meeting on Thursday, um, and that's one of the topics on our agenda, is to decide or to see if the Open Space Committee, as an entity, wants to write a letter to the board, of the Park and Rec Board to about what our opinion is about whether is this a good idea or how they should try to craft the design of it to make it as ecologically, you know, less well, least intrusive as I possible. I mean, they're clearly going to wreck part of Hills Hill. Pardon? Like, they're clearly going to wreck part of that if they put in the dirt bike yeah. trail. But, but um, you know... Part of the open space and recreation yeah. plan is also to meet the need, the I recreational I, yeah, needs that's of the community. I say that. And so, there are a lot of teenagers and a lot of kids and a lot of even parents yeah, another, who really love bike, mountain biking. And so yep, yep, yep. this is exactly the kind of struggle I, in a very small town like ours that has very little open space. How do you balance? Another, and another, we can't, we can't single-mindedly decide. No, that. no, but you can but, put stuff in about. Yes how the balance might be considered. I'm right. just suggesting that as something to think about. Yeah. I mean, another example is the, you know, the, the Town Day Road Race for the first time in history is going to run around the res just after they redid that entire path. That's not particularly smart in my personal opinion, but that's sort of another example of, you know, can there be something in there about balancing recreation use with, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, other rec types of recreation as well as sort of conservation and ecological pieces. Um, another thing, I, this may be in there and I didn't see it. I, I hope there's something in there that says uh, the town is against artificial turf fields because I think they're really bad. Um, and, again, um, that's not... It's I, not I would, in there I, directly, but... I would um, urge that it be in there. I just... You're, this says, I invite feedback from the board. That was on the okay, agenda. Yep. So that's another <laughs> one of my feedback 
um, from, from that. Um, it, it's interesting to think about the type of open space, too, which I, I don't think this gets into in any real great detail other than to say we have water and we have trees and we have, have parks. And I wonder if it's worth saying a little more about what the town's goals are for different types of open space and different types of wetlands and things like that. Um, the, the other thing that's interesting to think about is, is the, the plan talks a little bit about um, access to recreation, to the recreation areas, but it would be interesting to think about if there are, um, need to be additional recreational opportunities. Those places, clearly the sort of the mountain bike thing is one, but you know, when I used to teach this stuff, I would, I would say, imagine you know, you're in a community and you have to build a park and blah, 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 and the students always forget that there are a lot of recent immigrants from, from South Asia and they need to build a cricket pitch. So you know, part of diversity and thinking about is as the town diversifies more, are the current parks meeting the needs for the, the different diverse populations we now have? It even comes down to like picnic areas and, mm -hmm. and things like that. So um, yeah, I thought it'd be interesting for you to think about whether something like that could amplify the diversity section a little more. Um, what are, the Mugar property, I didn't see what you wrote in there about it. Can you just It's mentioned say? a number of times yeah, what, in different what? contexts yeah. um, about, well, in, in some of the background areas in terms of wetlands, wetlands areas and so forth. Um, in the goals, it's it's kind of vaguely referenced. Because um, there used to be one in one of the <coughs> previous ones about you purchase it if you can. Is that still right. in there or not? Well, um, that's not happening. It's kind of it's in sailed. there. Yeah. Well, well, the ship has sailed in part, right? But once they've, assuming they build the housing, mm -hmm. right, then I think the property value of the rest of it is going to be pretty low, right? Because it's not buildable anymore. <coughs> so if there were a time for the town to think about purchase, and it would never happen before, right? But maybe the, t <coughs> the time's going to be ripe for the length of this next open space plan to think about it a little more. Because if that's built, then the rest of it's non-buildable space. I'm not saying the town should buy it. I'm saying <coughs> it just might be thought of that way. So those are my feedback. <coughs> those are my feedback. Excuse Sorry me. for the time it took to no, no, that's fine. Thank get you. that out to you. Melissa. Thanks, Jean. Thanks, Jean. Yeah, no, this was a great report. Thank you so much. I think um, some of the stuff that I kind of looked to is just the, you know, implementation and the action items. So I was just curious, when you do have the collaboration and the departments listed, is there is it kind of listed in priority? Is that the first? Who's like the point person, not, or do you think of it like that? <coughs> no, it's it's not always. I mean, the um, the responsible parties list. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a little bit half. half as, no, it's not specifically by priority. It's just all of those are en entities that should be involved in in that particular item. Okay. Collaborators. Um, yeah, because I mean, I think sometimes it's just helpful to put like some emphasis on who's running point on some of the implementation. Well, once when we, you know, this is just like I say, the, the sort of the plan. Yes. And then <coughs> part of our job in the next seven years, you know, while this is being well implemented, and David will be, you know, working on this to, <coughs> you know, go sort of item by item and try to work with the, the committees. Some of its staff. Some of it's t town departments, mm -hmm. some of it's just committees, some of it's volunteers, you know, so it's kind of a mixed bag depending on the... But it gives you a goal. blueprint, right? Pardon? But it gives you a blueprint. To yes, work exactly. With, right? And you know who to, who to kind of go to. Um, and so each one will be, you know, kind of elaborated as we, you know, as things come up and as we work with them. 
Um, yeah, no, that was great. And I guess I just was curious. You had mentioned um, in your comments, Anne, about maintenance, that it's been an ongoing concern. I don't know if you could just elaborate a little bit for me to understand is that in relation to maintaining recreation, or is that just overall open space, everything? Every, everything. <laughs> is, it, is that just? Um, and because DPW does, ends up doing most of the work, and, and a lot of times, you know, there are a lot of volunteer friends groups that do a lot of work yeah, on certain projects, and so there's volunteers, but, you know, that has to be managed and sort of overseen. There has to be a, a management plan, and that, David mentioned, right. the public land management plan, which is a another plan, but <laughs> is looking specifically at um, de really detailing what management steps need to be done in each different location. Do you want to talk more about that? Or? Public land management plan will essentially be the operations and maintenance manual for a select number of open space properties. They're all town-owned properties. Right now, there are sort of inconsistent ownership and management responsibilities spread across different departments. I mean, you can think about Cooks Hollow belonging to, in part, the Select Board and in part the Conservation Commission. So it's it's a mix of responsibilities there. And yet, we need to proceed this year with CPA-funded feasibility study for Cooks Hollow and what that entails. So the Public Land Management Plan is designed to lay out a baseline. What are our existing contracts? What are our existing practices, et cetera? How do we find commonalities across different properties or different sites maybe? And then start writing contracts that speak to that. You know, we have shared need in X or Y types of fields. And can we get the mowing contract for all of those under the same umbrella so that we're treating things of the like kind in a similar fashion? Um, so that's underway right now. We are, I would say, roughly halfway through it, maybe 60% of the way through it. Um, we have KZLA, landscape architecture firm, working on it with us. And I think that's the run of it. No, great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then the MVP, you guys had um, the Municipal Vulnerabilities Plan program. Mm -hmm. Is that, um, does that complement this or that did that already kind of stay in its uh, like kind of contained plan or is this kind of incorporate elements of that? Uh, well, it addresses that and we, the town um, got some significant funding for um, for Wellington Park, work in Wellington Park of several years ago, and did a, um, a, vul a vulnerability planning process. I think it was 2017, maybe? Yes. It started. And then, as a result of having a vulnerability, such a hard word to say, <laughs> plan in, in place, we were able to get that funding, you know, in, for Wellington Park, which was already underway, to deal with flooding, because that was found to be one of the major concerns, um, climate-related concerns for the town. So um, I don't. So we we do mention the that plan in here. Um, there's I'm not sure what if there's another phase in that that's going to come in the future. Um, I know that um, facilities is and both through Jim Feeney, we're actually working on finalizing the implementation of of the Wellington Park project. And then we continually apply for funding through MVP grants um, related to that, but it's sort of tangential to the open space and recreation plan. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Steve, any, uh, I know that you sent through, and I, and I saw the list of, of great questions and suggestions that you sent through. Did you have anything um, in addition or anything from that that you wanted to highlight? Um, yes, yes. Um, overall, I, I would like to, to say that I, I thought it was a very comprehensive plan, and um, I really like a lot of the ideas uh, or a lot of the goals that were set forward. There is one question I had that I would like to ask, and it's just because um, I, I think it's a, a, a hard question and relevant for boards in general, and I'm just curious to, to hear um, you know, to, to see how it was approached in this case. 
So according to the, the appendix, which discusses survey participation, um, asks a number of questions about demographics, and um, helpfully break, broke down the you know, number of survey respondents along certain demographic parameters and also compared those demographic parameters to like, you know, AC, uh, American Community Surveys. So one of the things that, you know, you kind of notice is that, well, the, you know, the longer you, li uh, longer a resident lived in town, the more likely they were to take the survey or, you know, the number of respondents was heavily biased in towards uh, our, it was more common for people who had lived here 20 years or longer to take the survey than it was for people who had lived here for one to five years. Likewise, income also seems to be a predictor. 40% of the respondents reported an income of $200,000 or more, uh, whereas, you know, the ACS um, says that that's about 22% of the population. Now, I mean, as a board member, I'm aware of, you know, research that's been done recently that, you know, talks about biases, you know, that certain, you know, people are more likely than others to um, participate in local government. And I'm just, as, you know, as I try to figure out, like, how do we, what's the best way to, to sort of acknowledge that uh, participation bias and adjust for it or compensate for it. I'm wondering if that was done in the preparation of this plan or if uh, it's something the Open Space Committee talked about. Uh, yes, uh, yes and yes, I guess. Um, that was one of the things that we were very concerned about in planning and working with Horsley Witten on the whole publication, public participation process. And um, so we, we did a number of different things. There, there actually are described, I think it's a, in the first section, pages five and six or so, where it talks about the public <coughs> participation process. Um, but specific outreach we did, we worked with Arlington Eats to provide um, information into the, uh, the, their distribution process to get um, information about going to the survey um, to um, their users and clients. Uh, we also worked with the Arlington Housing Authority and had um, posters and information put up in their sites. And um, we also did a number of what we call listening posts in actual parks and at the farmer's market <coughs> and um, at other places around town to, um, to be members of the committee were there in person to talk to people directly as they, you know, walk through and along the bike path and stuff like that. So, I mean, you're, you're right that it is very hard to, to really get consistent or good feedback from the whole range of people in the community, but we did try and we worked with um, Jill Harvey and um, to, to try to do some outreach as well. So we, we, we did, did our due diligence, I don't know in terms of the statistics, how that came out, but um, we tried. <laughs> and that'll, that, as I said, is, will continue to be a goal um, throughout all of the projects, all of the objectives that we have to work on the, um, the, the different goals that are outlined is to continue to try to provide access to the entire community and to figure out better ways to reach out to <coughs> communities of different languages, different, you know, parts of town and so forth. No, no, uh, I, 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 you know, you know, like I said before, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I just, you know, I think that's a, a tough issue and I uh, appreciate hearing your perspective and thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you, Steve. And I just had um, two items I wanted to, to ask about, um, like, like Steve and, and my colleagues, again, I thought it was incredibly comprehensive. I actually also really appreciated some of the historical reference within the within the plan. It was um, it ties into a lot of a lot of the um, education that I think we're trying to do as a board too to help people understand how we evolved as a as a town. Mm -hmm. So that was wonderful to see. Um, like Melissa, you know, I, I think one of the things that really struck me was the challenges around um, around maintenance. And you know some of the observations. I think there was an assessment of 
recreation facilities that listed them either in the port of fair, the majority of them as, as port of fair in town in terms of their condition, which is... Um, the playgrounds, was that the... It was the playgrounds, was a playground but it also talks about facilities as, as, as well in terms of recreation. So, um, I mean, that certainly is something that to me, again, as we invest in, um, as we look to events, invest in more programs, really ensuring that we are funding the proper maintenance and, and care of what we do already have, to me is in, incredibly important. And I think that was under objective number three. Um, I don't know if the intent was for these to be in some sort of you know, sorted level of importance, but um, I think it was actually 3.8.5 um, was where the, the maintenance piece came, came in, um, which was an evaluation of overall town property operations and maintenance. But to me, that's something that I, I would absolutely highlight. Um, you know, the, uh, it's hard to get behind investing in, in other um, avenues when we're not maintaining what we already have. Right. Right. Um, so I just wanted to, to highlight that. Um, and I certainly understand the challenges in terms of who owns what, and there, you know, in some cases might be multiple municipal bodies that are responsible for, for that maintenance. Um, and then something else that I, I just wanted to highlight as well, which is something that came in front of um, this board actually as a citizen petition, is um, the way that some of our open spaces are currently used and, and programmed, and the availability both for um, bodies within town and nonprofits, but also for-profit um, entities to use some of the open open spaces to bring people to our to our parks and yeah. to for more community building. Um, one of the things that we just did as one of our Warren articles was to take away some of the requirements right. for, for folks to have to come in front of the ARB right, for additional approved. permits. Exactly. And so I think that came in in 4.C.4 and 5. Um, in terms of make, ensuring that we're coordinating and supporting community events. And, and I would also add to that, not just the nonprofits, but also for profits, really encouraging people to want to rent and use our parks and bring people together um, in, in multiple ways. So I was, I was happy to see that because I think in the discussions we had around the Warren article, that was something that was really important for people. Um, you know, coming out of the pandemic, people want to be to, together, and it, it's it's not just the nonprofits, but also some of the for-profit ent entities, which bring people together mm -hmm. in some of these spaces, and could be re revenue generating for maintenance right, right. for the town as well. Again, that's the Park and Recreation Commission generally yep. that supervises yep. most of those properties. Maybe the select board has yep. more park, I think. But. Yep. But I think it's yep. important for them to hear that this board thinks mm -hmm. it's important to support a wide range of activity right. within the, within the right. parks. Good. Those are the only Thank comments you. I had. I, again, I really appreciate all the work that went into it. Great. Okay. Great. Well, um, I guess we'll we'll look for your letter. I don't. Can you um, vote tonight? Yes. To so, adopt um, what I'd like to do is see if there motion. is a, yep a motion to um, endorse the plan. With um, I'm assuming that <coughs> you know some of the. Um, suggestions yes. that, that we brought forward um, will be will be considered, um, and uh, for the board to um, permit me to work with Kelly on um, a letter of support um, for for the plan. Unless there are any other suggestions, no, I just I mean we should do that. I just want to say the agenda didn't say we we're going to vote. The agenda just said um, presentation, and we were going to provide feedback. That is a good point. So, um, can we vote on it, still, Gene? I I'd be happy to vote, but I think we need to be more specific when we're going to take a vote on something in the future. Sorry, that's not what I wrote in the draft agenda. <laughs> um, At least that's the agenda I have. No, it is. It is. It was supposed to say, "and may vote <laughs> to adopt the plan." That's, I think we can still do Okay, that. yes. I think we still can. We will just yeah. ensure that we are specific about that going forward. So thank, thank you, you for, the, yeah. for the call out. I did miss it. It did not say that in the agenda as well. Um, so is there a motion to um, uh, endorse 
the uh, open space and recreation plan update and to um, to support um, me on behalf of the board working together with the Department of Planning and Community Development to craft a letter of support. So motion to authorize you. And to endorse the plan? Yeah, to authorize okay. you to endorse the plan. Okay. All of the above. Second. You'll second. Okay. Uh, so we'll take a roll call vote starting with Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Steve? Yes. yes. And the yes as well. Thank you so much for bearing with us this evening. Thank you. Really appreciate sticking around till yes. midnight or is it close to midnight? Not quite yet. We're not I'm quite glad. there. I hope this was a little more fun than your previous one. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, thank you. So that closes agenda item number three and we'll now for the record um, move to agenda item number four for number five which is open forum. Um, seeing no members of the public here unless you all have something separate that you would like to address with us. Nope. David's a resident. Okay. Go ahead. Now's your chance. <laughs> Okay, seeing no one here who wishes to address the board, we will close open forum and I will Access Madam Chair. Yes. Access Madam Chair. Yes. Um, please. I would like to just um, let all of my fellow board members know that you would have um, very positive careers on the Zoning Board of Appeal if you ever chose to do so. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the hearing we had earlier was difficult um, in part because I, I think there are some ambiguities in the bylaw. I would just like to note that this is something that the ZBA deals with on a regular basis. So to the extent that we continue the process of clarifying the bylaw where we can and making uh, their process more predictable and easier to reason about, it is worth doing. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Steve. That is an excellent point and something that I think we should add to our retreat agenda in terms of identifying um, opportunities for potential Warren articles where we have now experienced some of the Yeah, just 8.1 is exactly. a complete yeah. mess. Right. Yes. So, um, I think a complete, a partial mess. I want to be I have that. a question. I don't know if I can ask offline. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, One other thing. You. Are we going to meet? One, are we yes. going to meet in person at the next meeting? What are we going to do about that? So, uh, I think our, our our goal is to meet in person. What I'm hoping is that the hybrid meeting setup will be ready to go by that point. So I will check um, our next meeting of the remote participation study committee, which is working on the pilot is um, I think in another week or two. So um, I hope to get a better sense then. Um, right now the equipment and is, is the limiting factor. The, um, the structure for the pilot program is, is pretty well drafted. Um, but um, I, I need to, first of all, we need a room, <laughs> which I know we're working on. And second of all, um, I like this room. Equipment. Well, <laughs> we can also work that out with a select board. So, okay. <coughs> unless unless other members of the board would like to weigh in, I think the intent is for us to continue to meet in person, hopefully with a remote participation um, for the public, as a hybrid meeting um, soon to soon to be. So we got at least two emails about that. Are we going to respond? I have responded to, oh, yeah. I've okay. had three. Oh, we have three. Um, the third came from James Fleming, which will be posted to correspondence. Okay. And yes, to all of them I have responded that it is our intent to participate in the hybrid pilot program um, as soon as it's ready to go, which we great. expect in the fall. Great, great. Yeah. Get the pool table up and running. Right. <laughs> uh, any other new business? All right, with that, is there a motion to adjourn? So motioned. Is there a second? Second. All right, we'll take a vote. Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Steve? Yes. I'm a yes as well. Uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much.